podcast has not been sanctioned. The battleground was Monday nights. 80. For a campaign of 83 consecutive weeks. 3. There was a clear winner. This is story war. Weeks. This is the story of that campaign. 83 weeks. 20 years later, the time has come the whole truth. For the whole truth. This is 83 weeks with Eric Bischoff and Conrad Thompson. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. And man, we've got something special planned today, but we can't get started without the master of ceremonies, the man himself. Eric Bischoff, what's going on, man? How are you? Just living another day in paradise, my friend. Looking forward to this. I'm geared up. I'm fired up. I've been caffeinating all day. Well, I think people have been ready for this for quite a while. Uh, Everybody was saying, you should do a show with Eric Bischoff. And on March 26th, when we thought we were doing the very last What Happened Win with Tony Schiavone, Tony stayed in there. But I had already made a commitment to Eric, and we are proud to bring you 83 weeks. We appreciate you checking us out today. We hope you uh, go ahead and hit the subscribe button, leave us a five-star review, tell your friends, and don't forget to catch up on all the fun on Twitter at 83 Weeks. Uh, we've got the next handful of shows planned for you, and then we're going to go to the polls. So stay tuned to the end of the show, and we'll tell you what's coming up on 83 Weeks. But let's go ahead and tell you about today's topic. And then there were three. It's all about the genesis of the NWO, arguably the biggest angle in the history of professional wrestling. And we've got the architect on the line with us. And this is going to be unlike any other Eric Bischoff podcast you've ever heard before. So buckle up, boys and girls. Eric, are you ready? I am ready. Well, of course, the Monday Night Wars officially started September 4th, 1995. And I'm sure we're going to talk about all that in depth some other time. But let's start from the beginning of this story. As Bruce Pritchard would say, the rumor and innuendo is that the original idea for the NWA came from an angle in New Japan who had a working relationship with WCW at the time. Set the record straight on this, Eric. Were you influenced by this UWFI invasion angle in New Japan at the time? And when did you start to think of how to pull it off here in America? Uh, There are two questions there, so I'll answer the first one. Was I influenced by the UWFI invasion angle? The answer to that is a definitive no. What I was studying when I was over in Japan and what I was influenced by was the just general presentation of the product in Japan versus the general presentation of the product here in the United States. I was spending a lot more time over in Japan. I was there a couple times a year for extended periods of time. I was doing a lot of business with um, the business side of, of New Japan and just studying the way they, they operated. And one of the things that I noticed was that the product was treated with much more respect. It, it was by media, um, by wrestling fans in general. And that was due in large part because of the way it was presented. It was a more reality-based product from the action that you saw in the ring to the characters themselves, the performers themselves, and the way they carried themselves at every every level. It was just a much more respected business. And I, and I, I kind of boiled the meat off the bone and what became apparent to me is it was treated with that kind of respect because the product was more real. It was just more believable. And that's that was the genesis. That's where I was influenced, not by an invasion angle. Quite frankly, I wasn't even aware of an invasion angle if there was one going on over there. I know that's the urban narrative, and I know that's what people want to believe, and you know, people that want to take shots at me or the NWO or WCW, whatever. I know that that's where they derive a lot of that that perspective from. But the truth is, I studied the Jap- the New Japan way of doing business. I took away that it was more reality based, and that's what I was most influenced by. And where basically that led to me trying to cr- create in my own mind, you know, that transition. How do I take this very cartoony animated product, which WWF was at the time, and frankly, so was WCW. How do I take this product here in the United States and replicate the formula that was working so well in Japan? Well, let's talk about the diamond Dallas page connection, because I feel like that's a critical part of the story especially when it comes to getting Scott Hall and Kevin Nash over who called who, what were those conversations like? And is that really your first sort of, aha, maybe I'm on to something here with this 
realism that I've been looking for. Maybe this is how we could put a razor's edge, so to speak, on this angle. Well, I mean, the timeline was for a period of time, and I'm not sure whether it was a year or so, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, um, is when the my goal was, frankly, to try to figure out a way to create a more reality-based storyline, as I just talked about. Um, coincidentally, and it really was a coincidence, um, one day I was sitting at home, I believe it was – you know, a nice Saturday afternoon and, you know, Paige shows up in my driveway and, yo, we, I got to talk to you, which was a very common occurrence, quite frankly. I only lived about two houses away from him, so it was kind of habitual on his part to interrupt my weekends. Uh, but Scott and, and DDP talked a lot. And, you know, Paige came to me and said, look, I just got off the phone with Scott Hall. He's interested in making a jump. Would you be interested in talking to him? So I said, sure, if he's ready to make a move, I'm, I'm happy to do it. And yes, DDP did. Uh, he was the catalyst. He was the conduit uh, to to start that process. When it came to Kevin Nash, was he also the catalyst for that? Or was that an introduction that Scott made? No, I didn't really deal too much with Scott. You know, even though I knew Scott and, and I worked at WCW, I first came into WCW when Scott was there um, as the diamond stud or whatever it was. Uh, I never really talked to Scott that much. Uh, I, I did have a little bit of a relationship with Kevin, but it, it started with DDP. But I, I quickly started talking directly to to Kevin because, like I said, I, I had a relationship with with Kevin before he left WCW. You know, little known fact, uh, right as I started really um, getting a little bit of influence in WCW, it might have been right after I was made executive producer. Uh, not exactly sure on the date of it. Uh, I sat down with Kevin and tried to figure out where his head was at and make sure he was, uh, I wanted to make sure he was still going to, you know, be a part of the roster because we were trying to plan our stuff. And he looked me right in the eye and said, no, man, I'm staying here. And about a week later, he was gone. You know, and I understood why. I, you know, I got it. I didn't take it personally. But um, I did I did start talking to Kevin uh, directly a little bit sooner in the process. So let's talk about that. When you're having conversations with guys who are technically under contract to the WWF, are you not nervous about there being some sort of claim for tampering? I mean, you guys were really going back and forth, even before this angle happened, at least through the legal system. Was there any sort of hesitation or, Hey, we better make sure that we're, uh, sort of quiet about this or what's the thinking at the time? Well, at the time, and again, you know, I'll say this uh, probably frequently as we're doing these, um, context is king. You know, this was before the Monday Night Wars. This was before the head-to-head battle, certainly before the the trademark uh, litigation between WCW and WWE. We were, quite frankly, probably viewed as a pimpster on a hamster's ass, a pimple on a hamster's ass by the WWE at this point. So there was no real concern. You know, the the term in, in the, the legal term is tortious interference. And a tort claim is, is a serious claim, but it wasn't one that anybody was really too concerned about. There was talent going back and forth all the time. You know, there was talent from WCW talking to WWE, WWE on a regular basis and vice versa. You know, I made sure that when I did speak to them, it was on the basis that, you know, if and when you decide to leave, yes, if and when that it would happen, yes, we would be interested. And, you know, we might have even talked uh, general numbers, but it, at that time, it just really wasn't that treacherous to do so. So I find it interesting that you say that at the time, there really wasn't a few necessarily. I mean, you were a pimple on the ass of the WWF, but you guys are running the billionaire Ted skits, the huckster and the nacho man. I mean, all of that stuff had been on the other channels, allegedly with you guys sort of sending letters back and forth with each other. Can you confirm as to whether or not you had communication with Vince McMahon or his office about those skits? Well, you're jumping around in the timeline a little bit. We just went from when I first started talking to to Scott and Kevin to deep into the Monday Night Wars. And a lot of things changed, you know, uh, within that timeline, uh, Again, we're going back to when I first talked to Kevin, I first talked to Scott. No, there, it, I wasn't concerned about tortious interference because there was really no legal back and forth at that time. Later on, when we started kicking their ass and after we saw Scott and Kevin 
you know, come out as a part of the NWO or what was going to become the NWO. And once the NWO, you know, materialized and manifest on our television, then of course, there, yeah, there were lawsuits. There was a lot of shit going on that, that got a lot more serious and put everybody uh, on notice that we had to be a lot more careful about the way we did business. To answer your question, um, did I respond or did I send a letter? You know, I'm not sure if I did or not. Um, you know, I, I recall kind of a, as a half-assed joke, you know, making a couple phone calls. I think I even called Vince McMahon once in his office. Uh, I got his assistant and tried to get a call through, and I don't think he wanted to take it. Um, I know that the legal department, you know, certainly sent some 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 letters, but I wasn't privy to that. I didn't really, you know, they kind of kept me out of the loop. Um, the, the the legal side of the business did when it came to that kind of stuff. I may have gotten CC'd on something. I'm, I'm sure I did, but I wasn't really privy to it. For the record, the uh, billionaire Ted skit started on January 8th and Scott gave us notice on February 20th. So I got my shit together, bro. Let's talk about that. According no, 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 whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's, let's, let's bring that back. Scott may have given his notice when Scott gave his notice, but he didn't appear on television until May 27th. I don't really give, give it to him what happened between February and May. When did, when, when did we get the, uh, when did the lawsuits start? When did the billionaire Ted's skit start? Billionaire According Ted started in January of 1996. Scott gave notice February 20th and he showed up in late May. Hmm. All right. I'll go with that. All right. So one for Conrad, if you're keeping score at home. Now, according to Scott, the WWF yeah, contracts. I'm already, I I'm already hating this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is going to be shorter lived than the Ric Flair show. Um, according to Scott, the WWF contracts at the time were like 10 dates for 1500 bucks. And you really only earned whatever events felt like paying you based on the houses, a pay-per-view bonus again at his discretion. And he got a piece of the merchandise, but no guaranteed money. And eventually Scott goes to Vince and sort of complains that his income had seemingly plateaued. And Vince said, there's really nothing that Scott could do to earn more money. And allegedly even told Scott, he couldn't go to Japan to earn some extra cash. So then Scott asks a third time for more money, maybe this time on his merchandise. And again, Vince turns him down. Is that really the crux of the conversation with you and Scott that, Hey man, I'm, I'm happy here but I need to make more money. It's not necessarily a jump for creative. It's, Hey, I want fewer dates and I want more money. Is that about right? Nope. Nope. Now again, I didn't, you know, Scott didn't tell me why he wanted to leave. It really wasn't a concern of mine. I didn't really care. Um, I, he, he made it clear he wanted to make the move. Um, but he, he never really told me why he never shared with me why he wasn't happy or the details that you just shared with me. Um, so no, that, that, none of that was, was an issue. Dates were an issue as they were with Kevin. We'll talk about that. I'm sure. So Scott but, winds up giving notice on February 20th, and he does this having received a signed letter of intent from WCW for what Meltzer reported at the time as a half a million dollar guarantee. And not long after Scott put his notice in the WWF tells him he failed the piss test and sends him home. Scott says this is actually an old test and they just pulled it out after he put his notice in to sort of muddy the waters. Before we talk about the letter of intent, I want to know what's your reaction to the news here? Do you feel like Scott's trying to tell you about the test failure to sort of play damage control and spin it? Or what's your reaction when you hear about this failed drug test for a guy you already have a deal in place for? I, you know what? I'll, I'll be honest with you. This is the first time I'm, I'm, Hearing this, uh, it made absolutely no impression on me at the time. Clearly, it wasn't an issue for me. I wasn't worried about it. Let's talk about a, a letter of intent, because a lot of our listeners may not be familiar with the phrase. And I know that Kevin Nash has sometimes referred to these as, quote unquote, a deal memo. Break down what those terms are for some of our listeners who may not be familiar. Well, a deal memo and a letter of intent can, a letter of intent can be exactly the same thing. It's basically a summary of two parties' intentions to enter into a long-form agreement. They can either be binding or non-binding, depending on what the parties want them to be. Um, 
but it's, it's, it's essentially what I still use them today to summarize deal points so that you can move forward into a long form agreement without having to burn up a lot of attorney time uh, going back and forth on, on little things uh, to, to, you know, in the beginning part, it'll be getting phase of a deal quite common. And they were really common uh, back then. Does the $500,000 figure sound about right to the best of your recollection? Yeah, that does sound right. And the reason I remember that, quite frankly, is, um, you know, Sting was our highest paid talent at that time. Uh, his he, he was making about seven fifty, not about. He was making seven fifty. Uh, Ric Flair was in there at either four or five. I think he was. He would have been at five. And I knew I couldn't bring Scott and Kevin in at more than Ric Flair. And I certainly didn't want to bring them in there at, at, at Sting's uh, rate. So I, I think the five is right. That's, that's what I recall. And it, it would make sense. I'm glad you brought up Sting because when Scott goes to Kevin and tells him that he's leaving, Kevin asks, hey, what are they offering? And Scott says half the date for quote unquote Sting money. When do you remember the phrase Sting money becoming a thing? It was never a thing with me. I mean, th there was, you know, we had a budget in place uh, that had been approved the year before by the uh, Turner Broadcasting Finance Committee. So I knew, you know, the parameters that I had to work within. I knew that just politically, you know, from a, from a locker room perspective, there was no way that I could bring these two guys in uh, at more than Ric Flair nor did I want to bring them at the level, even if Rick wouldn't have been there, I wouldn't have wanted to bring them in there at Sting's rate. Sting was the highest paid guy. We were all comfortable with that. The rest of the talent was comfortable with that. Um, but I never used it as a, you know, a barometer publicly uh, with anybody. I just knew that with my budget, Sting being the highest paid guy, Rick Flair and a couple others there below him, that made sense for me. And again, you know, the conversations that I did have with both Scott and Kevin, I don't remember the specific details of them, but, you know, especially with Kevin, because I talked to him more just because of the previous relationship I had with him. Um, you know, Kevin, Kevin made it clear to me, and by the way, our dates weren't half of the dates. Um, we, we, we were guaranteed, we were, we put a maximum, I think it was 180 dates was our maximum dates. WWE was at 250. You know, we may be splitting hairs to a degree, but it's not half the, it wasn't half the dates. I may have felt that way. Right. <laughs> to Scott and Kevin and a lot of people. Well, but we had a maximum of 180 dates in there and everybody knew quite honestly, we never hit our maximum dates. We typically came in, or at that time, we were coming in at probably 125, 145 dates throughout the year. So it was a lot lighter load to them. Kevin was expecting his very first child at that time. You know, in WWE, he would have been on the road probably, you know, with the number of days that they worked. And then you put, a, you know, a day of travel on the front end and a day of travel on the back end to get home. They were probably gone 300 and day, 320 days a year. So it was a much lighter load. And when you added up all the money that they were making from licensing, from merchandising, from pay-per-views, from house show revenue, and all the other ways that they profit shared, I use that term loosely, um, they were probably making 500 or more at that time. But they had to work a lot harder to get it. And both of them expressed to me, whether they were being honest or not, I'll never know. But mo both of them expressed to me that, and especially with Kevin, and I knew it to be true with Kevin, because like I said, he was expecting his first child. It was as much of a lifestyle consideration uh, and a quality of life consideration as it was a financial one. It's worth mentioning that uh, a lot of the WCW payroll was made public during a racial discrimination lawsuit several years ago. And in 1996, according to those court documents, Scott Hall earned 379,295 bucks. He was there for 31 weeks. So if you break that down to the old Japan schedule, that's 12,235 bucks a week that Scott was making at the time. I'm curious, you mentioned it a few times there. So I got to follow up. You didn't want to bring them in for more than what flair was making. Was that some sort of edict from Turner or you knew that Flair was privy and you didn't want to stir shit up? What was the rationale behind not having anyone best Flair? Now, I'll make one thing really clear right now. I didn't have to go to anybody in Turner 
and get approval for any hires that I made or any choices that I made. I, I simply had to stay within a budget. Now, Hulk Hogan would have been the exception to that rule because he came in at substantially, you know, over our original budget. That required a Ted Turner conversation. But everybody other than uh, Hulk Hogan, when we brought him in in 94, whenever it was, 93, 94, that was simple. as long as I was with, you know, under budget or within budget, I, I didn't have to get an approval. It was, you know, the idea of keeping them at Ric Flair's money was simply a, a, a choice that I made or a decision I made based on the fact that if I, I knew if I would have brought him in for more, I'd have more headaches than I already anticipated. I knew it was going to be a controversial move to bring those guys in. They had a reputation. You know, the, the locker room in WCW at that time relatively speaking, was pretty stable based on what it had been in years previous. And I didn't want to bring two guys in from the WWE, especially Scott and Kevin, with the reputation they had uh, at, at, a, at a rate that was higher than Ric Flair's. But that changed the next year because the next year, Scott Hall made almost $200,000 more than Rick. What changed? Uh, the revenue the, the company was was generating based on the NWO angle. Right. So let me ask you this, uh, Scott and Kevin both say in years past, of course, if Vince had matched the offer, they would have stayed in this area. Did you ever think that you were really just being played for negotiation leverage with the WWF by these two guys? I never thought that. Um, but I, I, you know, I always questioned the forthrightness of, of, you know, anything that I heard, look, talent's talent, especially again, context is king. Back then, I knew that there was a good chance I was being worked or played, if you will. But for the most part, I took everything at face value. If it ended up I was getting worked, it, it did. It, you know, whatever. I, I didn't worry about it. I didn't, you know, spend a lot of time trying to read between anybody's lines. I knew what my budget was. I knew what I wanted to do. If it worked for me, you know, it'll work out. If it if it didn't work for me, it, it didn't. Um, I don't know that that was true, honestly. I, you know, I got the impression from from Kevin, and again, the story I was told, you know, by Kevin at that time, was that uh, he found out, you know, he had he had uh, he had access to some recent payouts, and he was looking at what he was getting on these payouts and looking at what everybody else was getting on those payouts, and he didn't like it. And between that and the quality of life issue, he was just tired of it, and he wanted to leave. And I took it at face value. I didn't really worry about it too much. Kevin has said that one of the turning points for him wanting to leave was creatively at the February 96 pay-per-view. Uh, there's a match here where Brett doesn't want to be power bombed and the office sides with Brett and Nash walked over to Scott and said, see if you can get me a deal talking about WCW and the creative is at least the narrative that Kevin pushes publicly as the primary reason for him wanting to leave. Did that ever come up or was it always about, I think I'm getting fucked around on my money. It never came up. Absolutely never came up. Not a syllable of that came up to me. It may have been true. I wasn't there. I don't know. I, I guess, you know, maybe Kevin had that, uh, as, as a major issue and didn't feel the need to, to share it with me. As I just talked about, you know, as far as everything that I can remember, he felt like he was getting screwed on his money. And more than that, and, and I believe this part, especially after, you know, all the years of working with Kevin now, you know, he's he, he doesn't like to travel. He doesn't like to be away from home. It was always a grind for him. And I really did believe and still to do to this day that the primary reason he came to WCW was the fact that it was a lighter schedule. Now, Bruce Pritchard says that Nash offered to tell the whole locker room that the rumors that were swirling of him leaving was bullshit. And he would address the rumors head on with the boys. And when Vince asked him to follow through, Nash got cold feet and didn't do it. So on March the 5th, Kevin Nash gave notice to Vince McMahon by phone of his intent to join WCW. And Meltzer even reports that the call was made around 1050 in the morning. Uh, Eric, to nail down the time like this, somebody's clearly talking to Meltzer. Any idea who it may have been? Do you think Kevin was speaking to him? Or or Meltzer's clearly full of shit. Okay. There's there's another side of that. Or I think probably the answer is somewhere in in between. 
you know, I think Kevin could have easily had that conversation with somebody. Somebody could have been in the room when when he had that conversation. I don't know. Uh, and somebody else could have given that information to to Melser. I, you know, I don't know. There were a lot of people talking to Melser at that time. And there were a lot of people talking to Melser and feeding him information that they felt would benefit them in some way, shape or form, politically or otherwise. So I, you know, I just because Meltzer reported it doesn't necessarily mean it was true. Although he always gets a lot of facts right. There's no doubt about it. He's got a lot of sources. No doubt about it. But I have no idea who would have been speaking to him. I doubt it was Kevin. I, I, I can't imagine Kevin picking up the phone and calling Dave Meltzer. But who knows? I've been shocked before. Meltzer reported that Nash was believed to have been offered a three-year deal escalating from 450 to 750 but Nash was telling everybody it was 780 grand. What number sounds right to you, Eric? I would not have brought him in for sting money. Right. I just would not have done it. I wouldn't have brought him in for more than Rick Flair. We're talking about when they first came in. We're not talking about what they got, you know, raises for later on. Um, but at that time I would not have brought him in at stings level. It's worth mentioning that, uh, Kevin Nash, according to these same court documents in 1996, made 336,261 bucks. Uh, the next year he would bump up to 756, even more than Scott Hall. Uh, let's get going here. Kevin as diesel, of course, lost to undertaker at WrestleMania 12. The following month, he lost to Shawn Michaels at good friends, better enemies. Scott Hall lost to Vader on that same show. And it's their last pay-per-view for the WWF until 2002. And it almost feels like the star sort of aligned for this NWO angle because all of a sudden Scott and Kevin's contracts expired just six days apart. When did you realize that? And is that sort of the catalyst for you deciding, Hey, what if we do a takeover or how do those wheels come into motion for this NWO angle? They were really, again, it, it, it's hard for me to create a timeline that occurred 20 years ago, especially as it relates to the NWO angle, because the idea, the catalyst for the idea really started a year or more before it actually materialized. So, you know, I'm going to give you general, you know, answers to some of this, and it's not because I'm trying to be evasive and it's not because I don't remember, but to try to pin it down to the week or the month or how it coincided with a contract issue is really difficult for me to do. But the idea when, when I knew Scott was coming in, probably a couple of weeks before he was due to arrive is when, in my mind at least, from, from what I remember now, that's when the idea started to form in my head. Because I knew I wanted to do this reality-based angle. I wanted to do a storyline where the audience wasn't quite sure if it was real or if it was scripted. Scott and Kevin both worked with WCW previously. Scott and Kevin both felt like WCW didn't appreciate them. They weren't treated like stars. They didn't use them right. Yada, yada, yada. We've heard it all before. They went to WWF. They became bigger stars or big stars in WWF. And storyline-wise, it, it, it became apparent to me that this was a perfect catalyst for a reality-based story. Two guys used to work here. They got pissed off. They left. They went over. But they became big stars, and now they were coming back to the company they used to work for to get revenge. That was the premise of the NWO storyline. So the 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 idea of the storyline, as it began to really materialize, started happening a couple of weeks before, probably uh, Scott and Kevin showing up. So when you, when you have those conversations, are you doing some sort of a conference call? Are you talking to them one at a time, Scott first, then Kevin, what do those conversations look like where you're sort of laying the groundwork of what the idea is? I, I, I didn't lay it out to them before they got there. It's, I, I definitely did not lay it out to them. You know, part of it is because I didn't trust anybody at the time to keep their mouth shut because everybody was, was spilling information from the inside. I had no idea who was talking, you know, to guys like Meltzer and Wade Keller and who wasn't. Um, there were a lot of people, you know, with my own company, or no, I shouldn't say a lot, but there were some people in my own company that I didn't really trust with certain types of information. Uh, and sometimes, look, it, it, it's not like, I want to make sure I make this really clear. 
I say things sometimes that I shouldn't say, not because I want to mislead somebody, not because I want to undermine somebody. In, in, an, in a fit of excitement, I might accidentally share information that, in retrospect, I shouldn't have shared. And this idea was so important to me that I didn't want to take that chance. Now, there were people there that I didn't trust. There were people there that I suspected. I never had hard, fast evidence that they were leaking information or I would have fired them. But there were certain people that I suspected. So I, I kept this stuff to myself. I didn't really share the details of the storyline until it was absolutely necessary. Not with anybody. Not with the booking committee. Not, certainly not with Scott and Kevin prior to them getting there. I had very little conversation with Scott Hall uh, until the day I picked him up uh, at the uh, airport Marriott in Atlanta and drove him to Macon, Georgia. We'll get there. Well, let me ask this. When the booking committee knows that you have signed Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, well, I guess I should ask this. When did they know you signed Scott Hall and Kevin Nash? Hell, I don't remember. Probably shortly after I signed them, I would assume I would have told them at that point. Uh, there would have been no reason to keep it a secret um, because documents would have had to have been generated. Um, people would have to know. It wasn't like I was trying to sneak them in the back door for crying out loud. I just didn't want to share the details of the story, partly because I didn't want it to get out. And also because I didn't have all the pieces figured out in my head yet. I mean, I had a general idea of what I wanted to do, but I didn't have it. I didn't have the beats to the story. I just had the framework to the story. Makes total sense to me. I guess my question is, what was the booking committee thinking they were coming in for? I mean, they've got to be, it's not just, well, they're showing up and we'll figure it out. They had some sort of ideas working on their end that, you know, you're going to kibosh, but chat me up. What did they think the storyline was going to look like? I'm not sure. I don't, I, honestly, it's, you know, you're asking me, a, you know, what, what did I think somebody else was thinking 20 years ago? I can't answer that. And that's not being evasive. That's just being real. Okay. Um, let's talk about what you do know. The conversations with these guys, did they have certain hot buttons and wanting to come to WCW? One of the things we hear a lot about is guys, of course, wanting to nail down the number of dates. And sometimes they ask for their hotels to be paid for. But one of the biggies is we want first class air. Another thing we've heard is guys wanted a later call time to TV. Does any of those type of talking points, does any of that stuff come up with these guys at all? It would have come up in your contracts. Of course, absolutely. It came up. The number of dates certainly became up again. That was one of the key sales points from my point of view, um, with Scott and Kevin, the number of dates was a real issue. Um, first class was a real issue. A lot of guys got first class. A lot of guys didn't. It depended where you were on the card, just like it currently does with WWE. It wasn't unusual, and it certainly would have come up. As far as showing up at the building on time or, or getting a later call time, uh, this is the first I've heard of that. Let's talk about favored nations. This is the clause that everybody's heard about in their contract, and I think you should probably explain what it is and then explain whether or not they actually got this and how the fuck they got it. If they did favorite nations is a clause in someone's agreement. For example, if I came to work for you, Conrad, and I had a favorite nations clause in my agreement, it would essentially say I'm coming to work for you for a hundred dollars a day. And if you bring someone else in, and they're being paid $120 a day, I am automatically uh, raised to that level, meaning no one can make more money than me. I have, to, I have to be on par with everybody else. That's a favored nations clause. Um, the favored nations clauses did not come up until later on, until Bill Goldberg really um, came along, possibly even Bret Hart. It may have been Bret Hart who is the catalyst for that. Again, I, there's just no way I can remember um, when, when we first used that clause. But it was at a time when we were bringing in a lot of talent, a lot of top talent, and we were writing big checks. More importantly, it was at a time when guys like Henry Holmes and Barry Bloom and, and agents and managers began communicating with each other because they represented... You know, you know, for example, Henry Holmes not only represented 
Hulk Hogan. He represented Randy Savage. He represented uh, uh, Bill Goldberg. So all of a sudden, Henry knows and is using one to improve the other. It's not unusual. Barry Bloom did the same thing, only Barry Bloom was uh, he, he, he was a little less uh, transparent about it. Let's say that. So it became necessary when we started bringing in these guys, especially at that level, you start having to negotiate different types of agreements, and, and they did give them. But I don't think they really started until either Bret Hart or possibly even Bill Goldberg's second contract. There's a longstanding statement out there that I believe to be a myth, but a lot of wrestling fans have just, you know, swallowed it and it's become fact in the wrestling business. These guys were not the first two to get guaranteed contracts in professional wrestling. Were they Eric? Fuck no, I don't, you know, it, it's amazing to me and I get this all the time and no matter how many times I talk about it and no matter how time, how, how much, how many ways it is so obvious that it's not true, but people still want to believe it. Here are the facts. When Eric Bischoff came to work for WCW as a cleanup batter on the announce team, working for Jim Ross and Tony Schiavone, I came with a guaranteed freaking contract. The first day I showed up on the job, the very first day, I rode to the town with Dusty Rhodes and Doug Dillinger and Janie Engel, and we drove to Anderson, South Carolina, and I got to the building, and one of the first people that came up and said hi to me was Larry Zabisco, because Larry and I worked together in AWA, and we're pretty good friends back then. One of the first things that Larry does is pull me off to the side and say, kid, keep your chin down. Don't stir up any shit, and you'll get paid for life. Because they all had guaranteed contracts before I freaking got there. So how this becomes Eric Bischoff started giving out guaranteed contracts, I'll never freaking know. I really won't. But it's out there. The it's deals- up to you, Conrad. It's up to you. you got to tell the truth here. Well, listen, I, I'm with you on this one. I'm going to call bullshit on a lot of your other silly nonsense, but I'm with you on this one. The Midnight Express had guaranteed contracts like forever prior to this. So... I mean, that even predates you there. So it's all silly nonsense. Now, let me ask this though, about those contracts in this era, are guys like Scott Hall and Kevin Nash asking for and receiving some sort of signing bonus of any sort? No, no. And if they, you know, if they, if anybody out there wants to show me a contract that proves I'm a liar or that I'm wrong or that somehow my information isn't right, I'll be happy to put ketchup on it and eat the prick. But you know what? Nobody asked for a signing bonus. Not that, no. Um, it wasn't common. Um, I'm really, really trying to rack my brain here to see if there was any situation that could even be construed as something that felt like a signing bonus a guarantee or, or, or an advance against a licensing guarantee or something like that, which could be construed to be a signing bonus, but I can't think of one. Kevin said that you came to his house in Phoenix and that's where you pitched the NWO angle. What do you remember about that trip? I did go to Phoenix uh, to meet with Kevin because I wanted to try to get a feel for him and, and just get on, uh, I guess the same page with him creatively and see where his head was at. I didn't pitch the entire angle. I, I let it out in pieces as I needed to. Um, again, partly because I wanted to keep it to myself, partly because it wasn't a hundred percent clear to me who the third man was going to be and how it was going to play out. I had, like I said, I had the general architecture of the idea down, but I didn't have the details and the beats, but I did go to, I did go to Phoenix. I remember it was hot as hell. Um, and I think we ended up at a strip club, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, I think I spent the night at his house out in wherever the hell he lived at the time. But, uh, yeah, no, it's true. I did go. Did you have any takeout? Not that I recall. Okay. Um, Kelly reported in April that an early idea for Nash when he came in was possibly some sort of play off of Nash's old character from years earlier. Vinny Vegas. This is hilarious to me. Your response all these years later to this report from Mr. Wade Keller. 
It's just so effing stupid. <laughs> I mean, first of all, I mean, I, you know, honestly, I'm just, I'm in shock that he would be dumb enough to write something like that. Who, who would, number one, who would believe it? Right. Number two, why would anybody do it or think about doing it? And number three, why would Kevin Nash go from being Diesel to go back to being Oz again? This is so stupid, but whatever. Hey, you got to print something, right? Around this same time, you did interviews with Mike Mooneyham and the Miami Herald, and you told both that you had no deal with Kevin Nash and that he had a big mouth and sometimes isn't afraid to speak before he thinks. Meltzer knew better though, and wrote, quote, Bischoff seems to be working some sort of storyline of his own. I guess technically you could probably argue that you just had a letter of intent or a deal memo here and you weren't technically lying. Is that right? No, I was technically lying. <laughs> I was protecting the idea. I didn't know those guys anything. No the business I, is a no, work. Absolutely. I mean, it is, you know, to, you know, it's not like I'm a freaking pilot, by the way, I'm not going to talk politics, but it's not like I'm a politician, you know, I'm not a judge, you know, this isn't a murder trial I'm involved with here. It's professional wrestling for crying out loud. Yeah. I lied to him. I used the media to advance a story. Imagine that. May 8th, WCW announces that nitro is going to be expanding from one hour to two hours effective on May 27th. Now, according to the legend that was supposed to happen anyway in August or September, but Meltzer sort of freestyling that's being moved up here in response to the ratings that came out two days prior where nitro did a 1.9 at 7 PM, but raw did a 4.1 at 9 PM Were the plans hurried along to expand nitro in response to the ratings, or was this based on you knowing that Scott Hall was coming in that day? It wasn't based on me knowing that Scott Hall was coming in that day. That would have been a programming. Just look, I had a lot to do with a lot of things. My fingerprints were all over a lot of things. Um, but scheduling Nitro and programming the network was not one of them. That was a decision that was made at the network level for whatever reasons they made them. Um, I certainly went along with it. We had to plan for it, prepare for it. But it wasn't me sitting in a room going, ah, Scott Hall's coming in. I'm going to pick up the phone. Hey, Brad Siegel, I know you probably had a movie planned, and I know you had advertising sold for said movie, and I know you had all kinds of other things going on. But I've changed my mind, and I want us to go you know, an extra hour now because I've, I've got a hunch. It wasn't that, I can assure you. Was anyone nervous about expanding the two hours? Briefly tell us the uh, commitment that extra hour requires. I, you know, I don't, you know, nervous isn't the right word, I guess. Um, we knew it was going to be a challenge, you know, in, in, in television, it's hard. We, even back then, it's a lot harder now, certainly, but even then it's hard to hold an audience's attention for two hours a week. It's, it's different if you're doing it once, you know, once a month or a quarterly special, like the clash of the champions was and things like that. But, you know, to, to go from one hour to two hours and eventually from two hours to three hours, you know, was, it was stressful to a degree. We didn't have a lot of experience doing it. You know, we, again, we had done the clash of the, you know, clash of the champions and things like that, but to, to bite it off every week was, you know, it was a little ominous, but I don't think we were nervous about it. Here's the ratings for the Monday night war in May of 96 on May 6th, the raw did a 4.1 nitro did a 1.9. That brings this announcement we just covered. May 13th, we have Raw at a 3.5. Nitro is at a 2.3. But check this out. On May 20th, Raw is at a 2.3, and Nitro is at a 3.1. The day we're here to talk about, though, May 27th, Raw does a 2.3, and Nitro does a 2.8. Let's talk about May 19th right now, though. That's the Slamboree pay-per-view going down in Baton Rouge, and it's also the same night that the WWF is running Madison Square Garden. It's... Scott Hall and Kevin Nash's last night. So of course this is the famous or maybe infamous curtain call where Hunter, Sean, Scott, and Kevin all K break K fabe and hug in the ring at the end of the show. And it really was what everybody was talking about. When did you first hear about the curtain call 
And did Hall and or Nash call you that night or communicate anything about this? Because it was clearly what everyone was talking about the following week. I'd probably find out about it the following week, um, you know, indirectly. I didn't hear from Scott or Kevin. They didn't call me up and say, hey, bro, guess what we just did? Oh, you're going to love this or you're going to hate this or whatever. Um, I didn't hear from them directly, but I heard, like everybody else, you know, through the grapevine that it took place and uh, didn't really bother me one way or the other. So between May 19th, uh, the night of the curtain call, and May 26th, the night before Scott Hall debuts on Nitro, what was your conversation like with him during that week? With who? Scott Hall. So his last night is May 19th and the day before Nitro is May 26th. So we've got a seven day week here before he's coming in to make Nitro. What, what, what were you talking about that week with Scott Hall at this point, you're smarting him up on the angle or you're not laying it out until you pick him up at the hotel. No. And I think I picked him up May 27th. And I remember that only because it was my birthday. Okay. (laughs) That particular Nitro. Um, no, I, I, you know, I don't think I had any conversations with them. If I did, they were, you know, superfluous, didn't really mean, mean much. I certainly would have gone into creative with him over the phone. I guarantee you that. Um, and it was probably more of a, you know, Scott, I, was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I wasn't wary of Kevin. I, and again, I'm not sure why, um, other than the fact that I, I felt like I knew him fairly well, or at least casually. I didn't have that same feeling about Scott and Scott's reputation was, was a little, uh, he had one. I mean, he, we, we, he was a little volatile. We knew he had some issues even when he came in and we talked a little bit about that. Um, so I didn't share with him. I didn't share anything with him. You know, well, let's the just, week before. let's talk about it. Like it is Scott had had some substance issues. So do you have a conversation with him like that before you ever even, have him sign a contract and say, Hey man, I need you to keep it between the lanes. Or what does that sound like? Yeah, it probably did. And yes, I did. I did have that conversation with him and he did assure me that he was getting his life under control. And I, you know, I eventually ended up hearing that story a lot over the, the next couple of years. Um, as we all know, but yeah, I did have that conversation with him and he assured me that he was under control and he wanted to come in. He didn't want to cause any trouble. He wanted to be a good corporate citizen. You know, again, you know, and you'll get a lot of guys that, you know, will will disagree with me on this or call bullshit on this, but context is king. At that time, the locker room when I you know, if you look at the locker room during the Bill Watts era, for example, and even early after I had kind of gotten control and the locker room at this time, as things were starting to change and we were feeling some momentum on a lot of different levels, not just with Nitro, but there were a lot of other things that were changing for the better. The general feeling in the locker room was pretty damn good. And I was concerned that bringing Scott Hall in and Kevin to a degree and the combination of them for sure could upset the apple cart and, and cause a big issue for me. I was more concerned with Scott than I was for Kevin. And yes, I did have that conversation with, with Scott, as I said, but I was assured by, by him that he wanted to come in and, and be a good corporate citizen. That's why I picked him up uh, at the, at the Marriott in Atlanta uh, and drove him to Macon because I wanted to spend some time with him and take my own read. See if he, see if he was bullshitting me or if he was straight. Let me ask this when you're telling him, you know, we're going to have you come into Atlanta. I'll pick you up at the hotel, blah, blah, blah. Do you tell him like, Hey, don't bother being, don't bother bringing gear or did he have non razor gear or did you just say, Hey, you're just going to do a promo. So bring some shit that would look cool on TV, just street clothes. Or at that point, no, we knew we weren't, we knew he wasn't going to wrestle. We knew we were bringing him in. I knew I was bringing him in to, to kind of crash the party by that time, at least for that week, I had the beats kind of figured out in my head and probably the beats for the next couple of weeks figured out in my head. So he, he wasn't going to wrestle a match. And I knew that it was just bring your gear, not your gear. I'm sorry. Just bring your street clothes. Okay. So, um, I don't know. I've always sort of found it fun that he doesn't know he's about to make major history until you pick him up from the airport. You wrote in your book. <laughs> no, he didn't. It's not like we all had a crystal ball. We knew this shit was going to work. 
May 27th, man, I don't think the business was ever the same. I think you really could go back and circle it. And there's one other date we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, but let's talk about the plan that night. You wrote in your book that the plan was for him to quote, walk down from the audience, grab a microphone, create a disturbance and spout off. He was a rebel pissed off coming back to WCW with a chip on his shoulder. The chip was that he had been disrespected at WCW. The company had held both him and Kevin back and now they wanted revenge. They were the outsiders. They had reached a level of stardom at WWE and decided to come back because they'd been disrespected. When did you decide to call them the outsiders or did that name just come about later? I think it just came about spontaneously because we didn't know what else to call them. I didn't want to, I didn't want to give them a gimmick name. I mean, that was the whole idea when, when I found out I was going to have to do nitro because it was not something I asked to do, wanted to do, or expected I was going to do. It was kind of thrust in my lap and you know, I know we're backing up here a little bit, but it's a, it's an important answer to the or part of the answer to this question. I didn't want to do everything the same. I wanted to be as different as I could possibly be from the WWE. I wanted a reality-based storyline. I wanted my characters to feel real. I wanted to blur the lines between scripted, typical wrestling presentation and, and reality so I could keep the audience a little bit off balance. So we didn't have a name for them. We didn't know what to call them. And I think it could have been just spontaneous. And that's probably how it started, to be honest with you. Let's talk about Scott Hall coming through the crowd that night. He has said that this is actually Larry Zabisco's idea because if he came down the aisle from the back, it sort of kills the invasion aspect before it even gets started. But having him come through the crowd makes it look like he really is from the outside or maybe that the WWF sent him here. Set the record straight, Eric. Did you have Scott coming in from the back or was this the original idea to always come down from the crowd? Here's the, I'm going to answer the question, but I want to preface this with, I always give credit. I try as best I can to remember where an idea started. And it's really difficult because when we talk about certain ideas that we all remember, this being one of them, it's very easy to remember the moment. It's very easy for me to go, well, wait a minute. I had the whole story kind of laid out in my head at least for a couple of weeks. I knew what I wanted. I had a lot of the details that nobody else had. So it would be easy for me to say I am 100% sure that was my idea. But I'm going to tell you that I could be wrong on that. It could have been an hour before showtime. By that time, everybody knows now. By that time, you know, I have to tell my director. I have to tell our producers. I have to tell the referees. There's this, I have to share what we're about to do with enough people that it is possible that Larry came in and said, why don't we do this instead? There, There is a chance that that happened, but I don't think so. The promo itself, of course, is huge. Uh, he's sort of teasing that he's going to be back with his big friend, and you're really patting yourself on the back in your promo here. Uh, well, maybe not in your promo, but it feels like your book is a promo at times. Who's coming with him? What did they do? How, what would the consequences be? What were their agenda? Clearly, you clearly never written them. You've never written a script. You've never created anything. And that's not a knock, but that's part of the process. And I shared that in my book, quite frankly, so people could help understand the difference between the way we were trying to tell stories then and the way Isaac Yankum was telling stories in the WWF or Doink the Clown. So, yeah, there, there was a difference. And I think it's important to share that while you're knocking it. By the way, have you ever written a book? No, I'd love to hear about your Scott Bayo series, though. What channel can we find that shit on? Uh, which one we did two, two seasons on VH one and 61 episodes on Nickelodeon. Take this pick. <laughs> I'm just busting your balls. Con, sir. I'm sure everybody is excited that Scott Bayo's 40 and single or whatever it is. You can pick on Scott Bayo all you want, but that at least the Nickelodeon series was, was a, a big money maker. Yeah. Well, he's, Charles ain't in charge of much these days though. Here's Meltzer's breakdown of what happened. A combination of bad matches, bad commentary, little hyper excitement, bad interviews, and bad angles resulted in a two hour broadcast reminiscent more of a bad WCW Saturday night show, as opposed to the competing Monday night raw. However, 
Amidst the attempt at a cure for insomnia was the debut of Scott Hall done in a manner that is almost certain to be one of the biggest money angles of the year. So he really puts it over huge. And he says from a one upsmanship category, it was the biggest strike Bischoff has pulled off, including the Lex Luger debut and that he's using McMahon's own storyline parody angles that were supposed to be used against WCW and ended up being used in WCW's biggest angle against the WWF as a way to draw money doing a Japanese style fake shoot angle built around a promotional war. It was retribution for McMahon attempting to make a fool of Bischoff on his raw show by putting one of his letters regarding the parodies on television and having Doc Hendricks saying that this same executive from Turner Broadcasting, without ever mentioning Bischoff by name, who had days earlier called to say how much he enjoyed the parodies. So Meltzer loves it, says the rest of Nitro sucked, which I guess in hindsight is sort of hard to argue, but you had to be feeling like this was a stake through the heart of Vince McMahon when this angle's done that night. Do you not? I mean, when, when he comes back through the curtain, you guys know you've got something here. Do you not? I had a pretty good sense of it. You know, I wasn't overconfident with it at the time, but it, you know, the crowd reaction was good. It kind of checked all the boxes I was hoping to achieve in terms of making it feel real, doing something that was completely different, creating a question. Yes, creating a mystery, forcing the audience to ask themselves what the hell is going to happen next. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do when you produce television, right? You're supposed to keep people tuning in from week to week to week to want to see where it's going to go and what's going to happen next. And I knew that we checked all those boxes. Um, but I, you know, again, I didn't feel like I drove a stake through anybody's heart. I didn't feel like, wow, I really showed Doc Hendricks and Vince McMahon. You know, I really want to up them. I didn't feel any of those things. I was excited because I felt like it worked. Um, I was, I, I got a good feeling about the promo that he cut, but that was about it. Of course the show goes off the air and it's pretty phenomenal. Uh, he's face to face with you calling you a Ken doll, telling you to shut your mouth and that we're sick of it. And you press him on who is we, he says, you know, who he references the billionaire, Ted, not your man that we mentioned. And then he has the famous lines. You want to go to war. And he says, we're taking over and the show goes off the air. I've always been curious because Tony Schiavone has said at times he didn't get much direction one way or another. And he just had to play it like a shoot. What did Tony and Larry know? And what were they coached to say? And this is, I guess it's worth mentioning you and Bobby did the rest of the show, but Tony and Larry start the first, I don't know, hour or so of the show. And this is the first time you guys did that. Was there some sort of concern as to these guys can help get it over and those can't. And that's the reason we rotated. We just wanted to give them an hour break since we had a two hour show and feature more talent. What were the announcers instructed to sort of put over that night? Again, you're, you, you ask me two different questions. Why did we have an, you know, an announcer transition or shift? And what did Larry and Bobby, or excuse me, Larry and Tony know? Um, the reason that we had two sets of announcers in a two-hour show is because I was of the mind at that time that the audience, no matter how good an announcer is, um, listening to the same two guys talking and selling and filling in the blanks for two hours could get a little tiresome, even the good ones. Um, so my my logic was let's have one team do one hour and another team do do another hour. In terms of what Tony and Larry knew, not a lot, and that has nothing to do with trusting them or not trusting them. You know, when I came up in the wrestling business with Vern Gagne, who really he and Greg are the ones that really. Uh, taught me, I guess, you know, psychology and from at least their perspective, what a wrestling product should look like and feel like to the audience. And it was pounded into my head over and over and over again by Vern Gagne that you don't need to know what the finishes are in every match. You should, if you're doing play by play, you should treat it like you're the fan, you're, you're the fan with the best seat in the house and you should be reacting to what you're seeing, not predicting what you're about to see. And a lot of talent has that challenge. Not a lot of play by play guys at that time were comfortable because it's just not the way they would know they were, they were trained. They were trained to know what the finish is going to be and what, who's going to do next to who and what's going to happen next week. And they, they were given so much information that they would inadvertently sometimes 
foreshadow it. And I, you know, I believe firmly that when you shoot a hot angle, it's better for an, if it's a good announcer like Tony was and is and Larry, because I knew Larry, I had worked with him in the AWA. They're smart enough to know how to treat it. I know I was, and I preferred that my announcers didn't know too much because if they did, they weren't reacting naturally. And that's what I was hoping for. Let's talk about um, the end of the show, because I'm curious, you know, the, of course, the longstanding thing with a lot of the guys in the back is everything's a work. Everything's an angle. How many of the guys in the back were sort of not sure? I know that sounds silly, but I mean, years later, people were still saying, Oh, Vince McMahon sent him down here to poison WCW. I don't know how that silly shit gets stirred up, but somebody in the back had to be getting pretty lathered up about this. Any funny stories you can share with us? You know, I don't really have any funny stories, you know, to, to share. I can give you the general tone and tenor that I remember. Um, there were a lot of people that were off put by it. You know, part of it was, you know, it was a combination of things. Part of it was the reputation that Scott had, you know, on that night. Here we are bringing this guy in. They see him coming in through the crowd, interrupting a match in the middle of a match, which had never been done before that I can recall. Um, shooting that promo, getting the kind of heat that he got. What do you think a lot of guys in the back are thinking? Oh, my God, this is working. That's not good for me. That's kind of the general, you know, it's a general, it's not uncommon for that, especially at that time. Again, context is king. At that time, everybody's fighting for their spot. Everybody wants to be featured. Everybody's hoping to be a main event. No matter where you are on the card, that's your goal, and it should be. But to have a guy come in from the outside um, even though Scott started in WCW, or at least was there for a long time, um, it still felt like, oh, great, another WWE guy coming in and getting the spotlight. So there was some of that, and there was some, you know, honest, like, what the hell was that? What are they doing? So there were, there were people that were nervous about it. There's no doubt about it. Looking back, is there anything you'd do differently that night? Hell no. I would have tried better. I would have tried harder to entertain Dave Meltzer. <laughs> so he would have been the first part of the show, but other than, other than making Dave happy, uh, no. I mean, it, you know, I don't know how anybody could, you know, even now, twenty some odd years later, look back at that and go, "Oh, they just would have done this differently." Um, how did Hall so, interact with the boys that day? You, you sort of alluded to maybe he was a shit disturber before, but now that he's here with a reputation, did he go out of his way to try to endear himself with some of the guys and try to make nice? Or was he sort of off to the side by himself? Or what do you recall? You know, he was sociable. I mean, Scott knew a lot of the guys. You know, there was a lot of people that were there, you know, when Scott it was it was in WCW the first time. And, you know, he knew a lot of the crew. So there was, you know, there were there were a number of people that he knew. And some people that had, you know, worked, I guess, you know, for a little bit in WWF. So, there, no, he he was sociable. He was He was very, even on a ride from, you know, from Atlanta down to Macon. He was humble. Um, he understood that he had a challenge ahead of him. You know, he had a reputation to overcome. Uh, he seemed really focused and prepared to, to, to do just that. He got to the building. He was polite. He introduced himself to a lot of people. Certainly, you know, like I said, some of them he knew better than others. Um, I don't think he could have been on better behavior that night, quite honestly. I worked on his promo. Uh, I literally wrote his promo for him on Jenny Engel's computer. Uh, probably an hour or so before the show, and he was there, uh, kind of adding to it, you know, suggesting a couple things as we wrote. Uh, we rehearsed it a couple times. He went out, did his business, and uh, that was the end of it. He was, could have been more professional. The Road Warriors quit the very next day on the twenty eighth. Do you remember what happened? Nothing. They, you know, they had been working back and forth with Japan, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Um, there was no heat. There was no politics. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about any of that. Um, it was just kind of coincidental. They, they decided they wanted to go back to work for Japan. There was a lot of things going on in the business at that time. And they just, for whatever reason, decided they wanted to go. The next week on raw Vince would go out of his way to say that diesel and razor Ramon are no longer part of the world wrestling federation, but that they intend to portray themselves as those stars they once were. And, uh, they're a part of a ruse that they're still a part of the WWF when they're actually under contract to a rival wrestling organization. 
and he encouraged fans to call the hotline or to check out America online for more details. When you see this or you hear it, I guess I should ask, were you watching raw on the monitor in the back at this time? Or does somebody give you the heads up during the show? Or do you just see it later on tape? No, I find out about it the next day, you know, to the, you know, to bust another urban, urban legend. I never watched the monitor. First of all, I was doing play by play half the time, or I was in the ring the other half of the time or preparing to, or working on other creative backstage. I wasn't sitting and watching a monitor. So call bullshit on that one. I didn't find out about it until I don't know. Probably the next day when I got back, I heard about it. So when you hear about it, I mean, you've got to know. Hey, we fucking struck a nerve. And one of the things that I've always heard in wrestling is if, if it's over with the boys, then it's over. And when you, when you see that Vince is sort of selling it, I mean, if he does sells it, then maybe, you know, it's not a big deal, but when he's really selling it on his show, it really plays to your favor. Does it not? Selling like a bitch. Yeah. Yeah, of course it does. Um, again, all kidding aside, it just it didn't matter to me, you know. Really, at that point, you know, probably should have in retrospect, but to to me, it didn't matter. I, I knew we were doing. By that time, you could feel the momentum. I mean, you would have to be, you know, you'd have to be a corpse not to feel the momentum and feel the energy and feel the crowd reaction and see the potential. So I wasn't overwhelmed or underwhelmed by anything that WWE was saying or doing at the time. Quite honestly. I wasn't paying close attention. You know, I hear about things that people felt I should know about. Uh, I was being made aware of things, but I I just didn't really care. So let's talk about, um, the legal letter that the WWF sends Scott Hall that they actually publish on America online. They even put out the message in an effort to further blur the lines between Ted Turner's wrestling organization and the world wrestling federation. Scott Hall portraying the world wrestling federation character, razor Ramon recently appeared on world championship wrestling television programming. And then they published the actual letter and allegedly in this letter, they say they're going to be withholding all future payments for like merchandise checks, the pay-per-view payoff and whatever else was owed to him until it was settled. And they're saying that this was deliberate infringement of Titans intellectual property uh, in connection with his appearance on nitro. And they're saying that his appearance and various statements made by him sort of express the idea that he works for Titan and he doesn't, and that he's staying in the razor Ramon character, which is something they have registered. They say that he dresses like razor, that he utilized a Hispanic accent given to him by Titan as part of that character. And you guys are off to the races when he gets this letter. Do you, does he bring it to you or, I mean, how do you hear about, you know, him sort of being uh, up against Titan legally here? I'm not sure if he brought it to me or if he brought it to Nick Lambros, who was our attorney. Uh, he probably would have made me aware of it, but it would have either through me or directly to Nick Lambros in our legal department. Um, but, you know, I was aware of it. I just don't recall whether it came to me first or it went to Nick Lambros first. So is this when you guys decide, hey, we got to go with the real names? I know you wanted sort of the real edge anyway, but according to the rumor and innuendo, you guys hadn't really settled on a name, and that's the reason you don't name them right away. Were other names ever discussed, or did you always know I wanted them to use their real name? No, I knew I wanted them to use their real name. We had considered even though i knew what i wanted to do we left the door open if something else made sense but i wanted them to be scott hall and kevin Nash, just like i wanted bill goldberg to be bill goldberg just i want like i wanted a lot of guys to be their own real characters or extensions of their real characters using their real names um that was it let's talk about um you know, the, the use of real names at this time, it really wasn't done that often. I know that sounds silly now, but back then it was pretty revolutionary. Not a lot of guys were using their real name. Scott and Kevin sort of came up in a different era. Were they cool with using their real name? Yeah. I don't, I, you know, if, if, if they balked at all, I don't recall it, but, uh, I just, I absolutely have no idea if they had any reservations about it 
you know, that they didn't express to me, but it never came up. On the June 3rd Nitro, Scott appears at the end of the show, and it almost feels like he's loosening up on the accent a little bit. Is that by design, as, as best you can tell? Probably. Uh, Probably. But by that time, you know, once you start getting legal letters, you know, you, 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 you've got lawyers now breathing down your back, or I have lawyers breathing down my back, and starting to suggest to me what I should do, what I shouldn't do, and what I need to be careful of. So probably um, that was a direct result of us probably getting a phone call from a lawyer at Turner Broadcasting telling us, or advising us that we had to make some changes. Sting and Hall get into it on that show, and Doug Dillinger pulls them apart, and Hall announces that he has a big surprise next week. What was your conversation like during this time with Kevin Nash? Because obviously he's going to be making his debut on Nitro, are you speaking with him once a week, every couple of days? What's it like on Kevin Nash's week before his debut? You know, if, if I talked to him at all during the week, it would have been a general conversation. Um, I, you know, there was nothing specific that I can recall us talking about, you know, in the lead up to it. Again, the way we worked, which is not uncommon, even today in WWE, when I was there, you didn't find out what you were doing on, on any given day until the day you got there, unless it was something very unusual or, or specific that required you to you know, prepare for it. Um, and that was no different back then. You know, we, we figured, you know, we'd, we'd talk about what we had to talk about business-wise when he got to the building. So it would have been just a typical week. Let's talk about it. June 10th. It's in Wheeling, West Virginia, historically a WWF town. You guys drew 3,500 folks here for 41,000, but man, houses are about to pick up. It's the go home show for the great American bash pay-per-view. And at the end of the show, Scott Hall comes out again and you guys have a verbal confrontation and Kevin Nash walks up behind you and he says something like you've been out here for six months running your mouth. This is where the big boys play, huh? Look at the adjective. We ain't here to play. Now he said last week he was going to bring somebody out here. I'm here. You still don't have your three people. You know why? Because nobody wants to face us. So we're really adding to the realism here, but unfortunately that's not what a lot of wrestling fans talk about. People love to give shit to Nash for the phrase. Look at the adjective. Let's talk about the scripting here of the promo. What was it like, uh, in this, uh, time frame of WCW? Is it bullet points or is it the extensive level of scripting that we see now in the WWE? <laughs> it wasn't anything close. It would have been bullet points and it would have been, you know, an hour before we go out, let's, let's go over it one more time if we need to. Um, but no, it would not have been the, ex you know, the extensive scripting that we're seeing now. We never did that. Um, ever. Thank God. Um, so no, Kevin and I went over it. We knew what we wanted, you know, more than anything, what we talked about is not, well, when you say this, I'm going to say this. And then when you reach up and scratch your ear, I'm going to reach for the pencil. And then you say, don't grab that pencil, bitch. It was never anything like that. We knew what we wanted to accomplish. We knew where we were going the following week. We knew what we wanted to happen the following week. So it was kind of like bullet points. Let's make sure we finish off strong. So we're, we're selling what's going to happen next week. We're getting people to tune in to see what's going to happen. You invite the guys to the pay-per-view. Of course they accept. And then Nash shoves the mic in your chest, pose for the crowd. They go off the air. What's the reaction backstage to Nash's debut? Was everybody pleased with the way this comes together? Yeah, they were. I think that the, you know, the, one of the things I remember either at that, that event or in the ones leading up to it or just after it is these guys were, you know, they were getting, you know, they were, they were coming in as heels, but they were getting cheered and that, that was probably one of the things that made the locker room more nervous than anything. Because how do you, you know, you're, you're being booked as a baby face, but you're working with people that are getting a pop. It makes working, you know, in the ring a very challenging thing to do for a lot of people. And, and you know, understandably so. Um, but I think the reaction by that time, it was pretty apparent that this, this thing has taken off. You know, the momentum was clear to everybody at that point. So nobody really bitched about it, at least not to me, but it, it was pretty obvious. This takes us to the great American bash. And up to this point, the guys are nameless, but they still come out to a big baby face pop. And then you guys go out of your way to say they do not work with the WWF. 
and they accept your challenge for bash at the beach. And then hall punches you in the stomach and Nash power bombs you through a table. Eric, is this your first bump? Whose idea was it? Did you walk through it that day? What can you tell us about this? Um, I think it was my first bump. Um, and it was my idea and no, we didn't walk through it. I'm kind of superstitious about rehearsing things like that. Physical, you know, physical issues, especially ones that are scary or, or dangerous, I should say. Um, I figured if I was going to get hurt, I'd rather get hurt on a live pay-per-view and, and have it make some sense and, and be worth something as opposed to getting hurt in a rehearsal and have to rewrite it. So I, I didn't rehearse it. I was pretty confident that I could pull it off. I had Kevin kind of walk me through, you know, my end of the, of, of what I needed to do to get into that power bomb position for him. We rehearsed that a couple of times, maybe right before we went out, uh, before the show. Um, but other than that, no, it was just, it was improv. Meltzer said the crowd popped and the other half was shocked. At this point, it had never really been acknowledged on TV that you were running things. Were you happy with the way it was pulled off? And what was the reaction amongst the boys when they see the boss taking a power bomb through a fucking table? You know, how people, you know, the boys, as you put it, how they really felt and what they expressed to me were by this time, usually two different things. Um, I know how I felt. I, I was elated. I knew it was a big damn deal. And again, because it had never been done before. Not that I was the boss, but even as an announcer, typically announcers, they may have been grabbed a little bit or they may have been pushed up against a table. Um, maybe somebody even slapped one once. I don't know. I'm not a wrestling historian. But nobody had ever picked one up and power bombed them off a stage before. Pretty sure that never happened before. So again, it checked the box, be as different as we can be from everything that's ever been done before. And I knew it as soon as I got up and, you know, I got carried back, to, you know, to the locker room and I was, went, wow, everything's still in place. I got, I can, my, I can move my fingers. I can move my toes. I can move my neck. Everything's good. But I could feel the reaction from the crowd and it was pretty intense. And, you know, I was still had a lot of adrenaline going through my system at the time too. So I felt really good about it. It's worth mentioning the week before this happens, raw did a 2.6 and nitro did a 2.7. The night after the power bomb happens, raw gets a 2.3 and nitro gets a 3.4. I'd say it worked. Wouldn't you? It got people talking. It was a lot easier to get people talking back then than it is now. So we definitely got a buzz water cooler talk. That's what they used to call it. One of my questions though is. There's no Hall and Nash on that show. So the night after this big power bomb, they're not on the show. What's the thinking there? Less is more. Yep. I learned that along, along the way, you know, you don't have to cram everything you've got down the audience's throat every week, just because somebody said you should sometimes making people anticipate and make them wanting to see follow up is worth more than doing it just for the sake of doing it. And that was the case back then. Meltzer reported, quote, after the 2.6 rating for Nash's debut, Sullivan was totally in the doghouse to the point he wasn't even invited to the booking meeting on June 11th, and there was considerable speculation that his days were numbered. By the next day, though, things were back to normal, although Sullivan had to agree to give up being an active performer after his current program finishes to keep his booking job. Of course, after this week, he's the company hero. What really happened here? We haven't really heard you talk about Kevin Sullivan much, and I'm curious what caused him to be in the doghouse. Why did you give him the edict? He had to stop wrestling and, um, how did he turn things around? At least in your mind? No, I I honestly, I don't, I I don't recall if there was a, you know, a, a major incident or not. It could have been any number of things. I do remember. I didn't want him wrestling in the ring. All you have to do is go back and look at some of his matches back then, and you can figure out for yourself why that would be. Um, They were pretty flat-out horrible. And then there was the conflict, the inherent conflict of the Booker also being a talent, which had had been an issue previously. Um, It was an issue with Ric Flair. It was a very difficult thing for Rick to be the Booker and also be, especially at Rick's level in the main event, as regularly as it was. And I didn't want that. I had 
figured that out by then, that it was just not going to be healthy. Uh, if there was anything else kind of extemporaneous to that, um, you know, I don't recall. Hypothetically, do you think if Kevin Sullivan would have kept wrestling that he would have beat Goldberg at Starcade 98? If he would have stayed the booker, he would have. <laughs> I mean, that's the way it went down. So after this, Titan was sending letters to both Hall and Nash to the point that Hall hooked up with Hogan's attorney, Henry Holmes, to defend him uh, in this Razor Ramon mannerism case. And, and his argument really is accurate, in my opinion, that a lot of that stuff really started with the diamond stud character. And he wants Henry to go help him collect the money that's owed to him by Titan. And eventually a lawsuit is filed by Titan sports on June 20th. And they're asking for a restraining order against both Turner broadcasting WCW and Eric Bischoff. And the lawsuit essentially had four counts. The first was unfair competition claiming WCW had to use false and misleading descriptions of fact that likely were to cause confusion in the marketplace and deceive consumers that Titan was somehow affiliated with this angle. The second count was trademark and trade distress infringement and false designation or origin regarding WCW using the trade and dress persona of razor Ramon, which was a Titan trademark. The third count was Connecticut unfair competition and constant disparagement of Titan sports on television and on its hotlines as either an unfair or deceptive act. And the final count was defamation and libel stemming from the February 5th show way before these guys were here when the lights went out at a live nitro in Lakeland, Lakeland, Florida, you and Steve McMichael were making comments sort of insinuating that maybe the competition had something to do with the power going out, but you apologized the following week. Now the silliness here is Titan wants TBS and WCW to fork over all the profits from the June and July pay-per-views and then pay triple those profits as damages plus their attorney's fees. I know you sort of said earlier, they kept you away from this, but when did you first hear about the lawsuit? What was your reaction? What was WCW's reaction? It really wasn't so much WCW's reaction as it was Turner Broadcasting's reaction, because at this point, and again, it's important. I think that people need to understand a couple of things. Nick Lambros was an attorney who worked in my office and handled all things legal. He negotiated the details of the contracts. He would handle lawsuit issues. He he really reported to the legal department of Turner Broadcasting. He had a dotted line to me, and I know what you know, I know you know what that means, but to our listeners, now if you looked at the WWE flow chart, excuse me, the WCW organizational chart or flow chart as it's sometimes called, you would have had me at the very top as a president of the division, and you would have had different people underneath me, senior VPs, executive VPs, that type of thing. Um, and then on that next level, on that senior VP, uh, executive VP level, you would have had Nick Lambros, who was probably vice president of legal affairs. The line between myself and Nick Lambros was a dotted line. It was not a direct line, meaning Nick Lambros didn't work for me. I couldn't influence Nick. I couldn't tell him what to do. I couldn't fire him. I couldn't tell him who he could hire, who he couldn't fire. All of that was between him and the legal division of Turner Broadcasting. So once that WWF um, lawsuit came down, it didn't land on Nick Lambros's desk. It landed on Turner Broadcasting's desk in their legal department. And then it got down to Nick and then it came to me. So I wasn't reacting to the letter as much as I was reacting to Turner legal and they took it very seriously. They knew that they were, they knew it was going to cost them money. So of course they got very, very interested in it. And I had to react accordingly. WCW's attorney, David Dunn squared off against the WWF's attorney, Jerry McDivitt in a Connecticut court for two hours on June 24th. Eventually, Judge Dorsey said he didn't have time to dedicate to this because he was in the middle of a major organized drug crime case. So it was delayed until the second week of July, which means it's after Bash at the Beach. The WWF is not happy with this and plan to pursue other options to stop it. But in this same two hour span, WCW's attorney Dunn brings up that 41 other wrestlers had jumped ship in the most recent few years and 28 of them basically used the same name and persona. And that Hall's mannerisms were actually in place in WCW first under his original diamond stud character. 
McDivitt said that if any Vegas and diamond stud were joining WCW, the WWF had no issue. And eventually the judge asked Dunn to have WCW play down the Ramon character and WCW's attorney agrees, provided that the WWF will not sue based on the July 7th pay-per-view. Of course, McDivitt doesn't go for that. And he also says if he had Eric Bischoff on the stand, he just needed to ask him 10 questions to prove his case. Did you ever hear that? Were you getting updates from court? Did this go as you expected? What can you tell us about this court date? I was getting a general update in, in terms of you know what we could do and what we couldn't do moving forward. I wasn't getting blow by blow and details and who said what and what McDivitt's you know reactions to certain things were. Um, I didn't get the detail that you just gave me. Let's put it that way, um, because it wasn't a matter of public record, or at least not accessible as such at that point. But um, I you know I had a, had a pretty good idea what went down, and again we were reacting to what we needed to react to from Turner Legal. Uh, McMahon sends out a press release after this. And I I sort of uh, laughed at this when I read it, if I'm honest, he says, um, he regretted filing the suit, but quote, I finally been pushed up against a wall with no other options, but to protect my company. My wife and I have committed our adult lives to building the world wrestling federation. This company competes very well. And I dare say stays ahead in a marketplace where the quality of programming, creativity, uh, start development and consumer interest reflects success. However, when a giant competitor uses your very own creations to dupe and confuse the public, then the playing field isn't level and you're forced to fight in a different arena. Did you see the statement? What was your reaction? It's bringing tears to my eyes when I hear this. You're horrible about myself. Just give me a moment. There, now I'm better. It is bullshit. (laughs) <laughs> tell tell that to Vern Gagne. Tell that to Jim every, Crockett. Jim Crockett. Tell that to Jerry Jarrett. Tell that to every promoter that Vince McMahon put out of business. You know, with with the, the way he did business and stealing talent and raiding territories and blocking them from buildings. These poor little old mom and pop promoters <laughs> put out of business by this multi generational behemoth called the WWF. Three generations old. By God, my grandfather started this company. Yeah, I felt really bad about that. Um, and you can tell to this day, I'm still carrying much of that over with me. But I thought it was, you know, I look, kidding aside, you know, he, I wish we would have had, you know, attorneys that were willing to fight and were smart and determined and passionate about that fight as Jerry McDivitt and his team was. It was a bullshit lawsuit, in my opinion, for a lot of reasons. Um, I understand why he did it, because he had no choice, because we were stomping him. And he felt like that was the only thing he could do. And he was desperate. And he won. So good for him. Um, but I, I didn't agree then. And I, to this day, don't agree with the basis for the suit. But it doesn't really matter. Suits are not often won or not always won by who's right or who's wrong. It's who's willing to stick out the fight the longest. Meltzer would write WCW officials claim that they are researching trademarks for current plans, new ring names for Holland Nash. If the name's clear, they'll be given those names as soon as possible. If not on the July 7th pay-per-view, they'll be referred to by the announcers as Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. I know you said a moment ago, you always wanted them to use their real name to give it an air of realism, but this lawsuit sort of cements that that's the direction you need to go and really supports that idea. Does it not? It does, but I don't know how accurate that element of the lawsuit was. I don't think there was a lot of conversation between myself and the legal department when it came to, you know, I certainly didn't talk to them about what I was thinking and what I wanted to do back in May um, at that point, because there wasn't the issue, or at least not to the extent that it is at this point. Um, You know, I, I, I... I can't put myself in David Dunn's mind and and why he wrote what he wrote or took the position he took, but he did. Let's talk a little bit about, um, the, the lawsuit, because one of the things I I saw in my research is that they're really debating things that were set on the hotline, which was hilarious to me, but it comes up a lot in court to the point that allegedly legal required Mark Madden to start submitting his scripts before it was his day on the hotline three days ahead of time. So they had a chance to approve it. 
Do you remember there being some fallout for the WCW hotline, as silly as that is? Where did that come from? Just out of curiosity. It's got to be Meltzer or Keller. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, legal wouldn't, you know, legal may, again, you know, this is trying to. 22 add, years later. Yeah. No, it's not even 22 years later. I'm now trying to add credibility to a Dave Meltzer or Wade Keller report, which we've already discovered in this podcast. Some of it was just nonsense and bullshit. So if they wrote it and if there was a kernel of truth in that, here's what I suspect. Mark Madden was hard to manage. Mark Madden often went into business for himself. I will readily admit that there were things that Mark Madden said on that hotline that caused any number of issues, some big, some small. So it's not inconceivable to me that there's some truth to that report. Um, I don't think anybody would have requested a script, but certainly they, you know, they might want to be well aware of what kind of topics are going to be covered and how. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the lawsuit again, and then we'll put a bow on it for now. Is it true? This fucking thing went on for four years and wasn't until 2000 when it was finally settled. I don't know. Again, I wasn't involved in the details of the suit other than, you know, when I had to be deposed or when in the process of discovery, I had to turn over my records or whatever I had to do as, as my part in that. So I, I can't tell you how long it went on and how it was settled and what the settlement was because I wasn't, I wasn't a part of it. That was handled by a whole universe of people that I hadn't, I didn't talk to on a daily basis or a regular basis. Okay, Eric, let me pause the action here to thank one of the sponsors of our show. And I think our wrestling listeners are really going to dig this one. Nitro, the incredible rise and inevitable collapse of Ted Turner's WCW is set to be released on July 6th. With the inside knowledge of a journalist, the perspective of a historian, and the passion of a fan, author Guy Evans provides a fresh look at an unfortunate inevitability, the downfall of world championship wrestling. Bolstered by exclusive interviews with over 120 TBS and WCW employees, Nitro contains a host of new revelations, including never before heard details of the controversial WCW sale, reported sabotage allegations, top secret Turner executive meetings, confidential TBS memos, and what the suits really thought of wrestling on TNT in their own words. Notable interviews include Eric Bischoff, former TBS president, Bill Burke, Kevin Nash, Diamond Dallas Page, and many more. Here's your website to pre-order. It's WCWNitroBook.com. That's WCWNitroBook.com. And follow them on Twitter at WCWNitroBook. At the end of the June 24th Nitro from Charlotte, Hall and Nash come through the crowd, this time with baseball bats. And that brings out a ton of cops to protect Sting, Luger, the Steiners, and the Harlem Heat, who are in a three-way tag team match. Eventually, Hall and Nash retreat to the back rather than going through the crowd. In hindsight, was that a mistake to have them go through the back instead of through the crowd? Yeah, I think so. I, I think it's fair. In retrospect, probably a, a detail, an element of that angle that would have improved it had they gone through the crowd. I, I would, I, I'll take that one. Kevin Nash has told a story where he's in the back and they're being told by Turner standards and practice that they couldn't use bats. And Kevin Sullivan was standing there and said, do not use baseball bats. But he was shaking his head. Yes. The entire time while he's saying that, do you guys remember getting in any sort of trouble or any sort of uh, conversation with Turner afterwards about carrying the bats to the ring after they'd specifically said not to probably, you know, there was a constant struggle between myself, other people within WCW, you know, on the creative side of things and standards and practices. So yeah, I don't remember the details of it, but it, it sounds like it probably happened. And it sounds like something, it sounds like something Kevin Sullivan would do. It also sounds like something that you could be fired for. And, and you know, a thing or two about firing people, which is why we've got a brand new shirt 
over at ericbischoff.com. That's right. T-shirts for the podcast. Who'd have thought? You can check it out right now at ericbischoff.com and maybe the best debut shirt of all. You've heard about the famous way that Steve Austin was fired by FedEx. Well, we've got a shirt that says fired in the FedEx font and colors. This is the most fun shirt ever. Pick it up right now over at ericbischoff.com. We've also got a couple of other shirts, maybe one of my favorites, Easy Does It, and it's in that old school Easy E font. And eventually, when you pick up a shirt from ericbischoff.com, what's going to happen, Eric? You're going to get a call. I'm following in Bruce Pritchard's lead. He, he is my podcast spirit animal. <laughs> his tracks. <laughs> you made him a you made him a wealthy mad man, Mr. Thompson. So I'm going to I'm going to. I always read that if you want to be successful, follow other successful people. So that's what I'm going to do. Well, the show, of course, is being brought to you free today. We appreciate you tuning in. Tell your friends to click the subscribe button and go ahead and leave us a review as well. But while you're at it, pick up a shirt and then you can pick Eric's brain and grill his ass just like I am too. So you're not just getting a shirt, you're getting a great experience and it happens at ericbischoff.com. This fired shirt might actually be my favorite podcast shirt ever. Uh, so go check it out for yourself. I'm to buy the first one. I really am. Well, there you go. Um, Kevin also says this night that you sort of made WCW look really weak since two WWF guys with bats could hold off six of WCW's top stars. In hindsight, is that fair? It's psychology. And psychology, like beauty, is in the eyes of the beholder. Um, I think it could be interpreted that way. I think you're really, you know, you're, you're splitting hairs. I think you need to put the whole thing in context. I think it has to be measured against what happened the following week, what the follow-up was. Um, in retrospect, um, sure, we could have had all, w, all those WCW guys just beat the hell out of, uh, out of Hall of Nash and take their bats away from them and beat their brains out. Might not have got, got us where we wanted to be. You know, you can only put so much logic in a wrestling storyline before you're doing a documentary and nobody cares. Let's talk a little bit about, um, the go home edition here of bash, uh, at the beach. It's nitro of course, and it's July 1st. It's in Landover. Nitro is going to do a 3.7. Raw's going to do a 2.7. And this is the first time you actually refer to them by their names on TV. And they come out to start the second hour to a bit of a baby face reaction and they sit in the front row eating popcorn. And later they get a police escort to their car with Nash mocking them, but no interaction with their opponents that week. What's the thinking here? Is this old school? Let's not let them touch. If you want to see it, you've got to buy the pay-per-view. It's part of it. It's also character development. You know, it was furthering that storyline. They were disrupting WCW. They were there to turn it upside down. They were there to be a pain in the ass. Um, Nothing really more to it than that. It was just to help build their characters. One of the other things I've always wanted to ask is how you guys went about selecting who was going to be the opponents, you know, who, who was going to be the WCW representation. Um, mean Gene announced that it's going to be Randy Savage sting and Lex Luger. And it's been said that they were really six in consideration giant sting Lex Savage Flair and Hogan. Now we'll circle back to Hogan later. Let's save that one for now. Why not Flair? I know that it sounds like a Homer when I say that I get that, but to me, Flair was really like the WCW guy. And if they're going to be out there sort of mocking that they're old and that it's Southern and Radnack and blah, blah, blah. Flair being sort of the Southern representative of wrestling seemed to make sense to me. Why did you decide ultimately to go the other way and go Sting, Lex, and Savage? Two reasons. One is I needed something to hold back. I needed somewhere to go. You know, one of my favorite questions back in the day when bookers or writers or people on the booking committee would come to me with an idea, my first question to, the, to them was, great, where's it going to go? And that's usually what you heard. Absolutely nothing. Because people weren't thinking about what happens next. And I knew, Rick, I knew look, Rick Flair was WCW. He was as much WCW as Ted Turner was at that point. But we needed somewhere to go down the line. That was one reason. 
The other reason, quite frankly, is I wanted to skew a little bit younger. One of the challenges that we had in WCW at that time from an advertising point of view, the business of the wrestling business, not the wrestling fan side of the wrestling business, but the business side of the business, advertising, is that we had to skew broader and we had to skew younger. And that's exactly what I wanted to do um, with the WCW division, I guess, of that, that equation is to go as young as I could and leave fair, leave flair you know, on reserve in my back pocket so that when we needed to take the story to the next level, he was there and he, he wouldn't have been tainted by what was about to go down. Let's talk about the week leading up to the bash at the beach, because Meltzer says the original plan was for Lex to be the third man, but there's also, there's also rumors out there about Tatanka, Mabel, Crush, Brian Clark, Roddy Piper, Isaac Yankum, the British Bulldog, Bret Hart. At any point, were any of these names ever discussed? I was thinking about using Meltzer's mother, but she wasn't available. Uh, no, that was that's so ludicrous. And people wonder why I get hot. People wonder why Bruce gets hot. There's a perfect example of the legacy of Dave Meltzer. Where those names came from, I have no freaking idea. None. Absolutely none. It's, there's nothing that he has ever printed that could be more stupid, more ludicrous, and more untrue than that. That's saying a lot. Let's talk a little bit about um, Bret Hart just briefly. Because there's rumors, because his contract is a uh, sort of up for grabs and you're going to be competing very soon for it. Was Bret Hart ever considered? Were you having any conversations? I mean, had you even spoken to Bret at this point about anything, not necessarily this angle. First, you asked two questions. The first answer is absolutely friggin' not. Bret Hart was never a syllable of a conversation, a syllable, uh, in any statement that was any part of any conversation as an option never happened. Put that one to bed. Had I talked to Brett? I don't think at that point I had talked to Brett. I mean, I think I met Brett after that for the very first time. Um, but no, at that point it was never, the only other person that was, it was to me, it was always going to be the three that I chose and sting was going to be the guy that was going to turn because I wasn't sure about Hulk. And I know you want to talk about that later on, but I wasn't looking for anybody outside of that equation. I wasn't looking at anybody from the WWF. I wasn't looking at Dave Meltzer's mother. I wasn't going to hire, you know, <laughs> anybody that I knew from high school. None of that. It, it, it was always going to be internal. Okay. Well, let's actually get, get cooking here. You wrote this in your book about sting. We spent four or five weeks developing the idea, giving hints and laying the groundwork. And we planned to unveil the third guy at bash at the beach. I didn't know myself. It had to be someone inside WCW, but beyond that, I wasn't sure I decided to approach sting, but I didn't know if he'd do it. Joining the outsiders, many would have to turn heel and sting had always been a very successful babyface character. Sting was receptive, not knock me over enthusiastic, but receptive. Everyone could see the power in this storyline was developing just a few weeks old. It was already one of the most interesting stories in the last five or 10 years. And we began discussing how the storyline might develop. I talked to him a couple of times in person and over the phone. No one else knew we were talking, not even Scott and Kevin, the identity of the third person had to be kept an extremely tight secret. I'm always been curious about this and everybody has their own opinion, Eric. How might the business have been different if Sting had been over the moon about the idea? And when you tell Kevin and Scott, they're both pushing for it before you ever speak to Hulk. If all three guys were super enthused about it, what might that look like? Hypotheticals are always hard, Conrad, to, you know, to be fair to everybody. Who knows? You know, is there a chance that that angle could have been even hotter? Maybe somebody has that. Maybe somebody has that opinion. I don't. Um, in my opinion, it would have been good. It could have even been borderline great. 
But I don't think it would have been something that we'd be talking about 20 some odd years later. Well, let's get to what we're here for. Allegedly, you visit Hulk Hogan at his house to pitch him on an idea of turning heel. And he basically showed you the door. This is a pretty famous story. Was this before or after you had the idea for the NWO? I was in like a year. Well, the idea was kind of forming in my head. And again, as a result of being over Japan and trying to do something that felt more real as, as well as, you know, back when I, and now we're skipping, a, skipping around the timeline. So it's easy to get things a little confused, at least for me, even with all this caffeine. But I think it was about a year before um, that I pitched Hulk uh, the idea of turning heel, partly because the baby face red and yellow thing just wasn't working. I mean, it, it wasn't. Hulk knew it. I knew it. Um, sure, you could go to center stage or you could, you know, do a clash of the champions and you'd get your requisite, you know, Pavlovian, you know, response where certain people at ringside would cheer and they'd wear their yellow shirts and, you know, swing their yellow foam fingers and all that. But the largest majority of the audience weren't buying it anymore. And it was apparent to everybody. Um and again, I wanted to do, I knew we had to do something different. So I went to Hulk's house. I, I, I flew down. I had my own plane at the time. I flew down, uh, met him during the week, middle of the afternoon. We sat and had a talk, probably had a beer, everything. You know, we had a really good relationship. And then I went into my pitch. And he very politely looked at his watch and said, well, you know, thanks for coming down. I got to go pick the kids up at school. And walked me to the door, and that was the end of it. Uh, he went off to go do a movie, and I went back to work. And shortly thereafter, the NWO ideas started coming, you know, materializing in my head, and Scott and Kevin, and then it was like, who's going to be the third guy? And now we're at that point in a storyline where I'm talking to Sting about that. And eventually Hogan calls and says he wants to talk to you, so come out to L.A. where I'm filming a movie, saying it with muscles. And Hogan sends a limo for you. When you get there, you arrive in his trailer and allegedly there's beers and cigars waiting for you. And he hits you with, so brother, who's the third guy? Take it from here, Eric. I, you know, I, I, I had mixed emotions and I remember that night pretty well because I knew I was being, I don't want to say set up, but I knew there was a reason that he wanted me to come out and talk to him. You know, he couldn't get away from the movie set. I didn't mind going out to L.A. So I, but I knew there was something big on his mind. And I could tell by the tone in his voice when we talked on the phone that he was kind of feeling optimistic or positive. So I was, I was pretty curious when I got there. And I, and I suspected that it had something to do with what, you know, he was seeing. I think it was Jimmy Hart was sending him cassette tapes of Nitro at the time. So he was following along, um, watching what was developing. So I was, I was curious, but I was, I wasn't feeling, uh, there was no trepidation. You know, I, I was just more than anything. I was curious. And when we sat down and, you know, cracked a beer, lit up a cigar and he said, well, you know, who's the third guy. I don't remember word for word my, what my response was, but it was probably, you know, well, who do you think it should be? You know? And that's when he jumped in said, you're looking at it, brother or something to that effect. Let me ask this. Once, once you have a plan in place with Hogan, you decide to keep staying as a backup plan. Is that right? Yep. So were you not sold on Hogan going through with it? Or did you feel like Hogan really had more to lose or what made you think you needed a backup plan? Hulk would from time to time overthink things. I wasn't a hundred percent sure that he wouldn't get back home or sit on the movie set or have somebody in his ear, have Peter Young call him and tell him, no, you can't do that. Or his attorney or his wife or his kids or any number of other people that, you know, would, would basically, you know, create doubt. Uh, Cause it, I knew it was a big move. I knew from, you know, my previous experience, even talking to him about turning Hill was a huge thing for him. And it was, you know, and it was, it was real. It wasn't just, you know, I don't want to be that character, brother. It was, look, you know, I've spent 20 or some odd years, you know, building a relationship with kids and families and mothers and fathers and, you know, 
children's hospitals and Make-A-Wish kids. And, you know, he wasn't at all excited about the prospect of dumping all over that. And I understand that. Um, he was also concerned back when I was trying to talk him into turning heel. You know, he had kids that, you know, were young and were in school and were going to be subjected to, you know, kids can be kind of cruel to each other. So all those things weighed in. And I wasn't 100% sure that, you know, six or eight months that had gone by um, was enough to to convince him that now was a good idea. So I, I had to have a plan B. I didn't, I didn't want to get there, build a great story, and then all of a sudden the day of figure out that, well, guess what, brother, <laughs> decided against it, brother. So I, I wanted to make sure we had a plan B. So when you go to Sting now, who's been pitched this idea and it's clearly a money idea, but it is sort of out of his comfort zone too. How does he take knowing that I'll do respect. It's not as big of a deal if you turn. So you're on the sidelines. Yeah. You know, I, I can't put myself in Sting's mind. I, I, I can't. My impression was that he was probably 55% of them was relieved and 45% of them was disappointed. I think it was close. I think like everybody, including Hulk, you know, everybody saw that the story was building and building and building. And this was a moment that would have been a career defining moment. Um, but it was also risky. You know, it's easy to sit back now and go, oh man, it would have been so great for him, but maybe not. You know, we don't know. It's a, it's a hypothetical. But I think in his heart, um, just looking into his eyes when I told him, I had the distinct feeling that, you know, he's a little bit relieved, but partially disappointed, possibly because he may have thought that I didn't have the confidence in him, which wasn't true. I had a lot of confidence in him because Singh and I were pretty close friends at that point. And it wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with my confidence in him. It's just that, you know, if you put Hulk Hogan turning heel on a scale and Sting turning heel on a scale, one was going to have more impact than the other. It was just straight up business. Let's talk about some straight up business. When did you lay out the match and the promo for Hogan? You know, I don't lay, I, you know, I never laid out matches. That wasn't my forte. It still wouldn't be to this day. Um, I would lay out a story. I would say, look guys, here's what we would like to see happening at the end. Let's work backwards from the finish. Um, Here's what I see. You guys figure out how to do it best in the ring. I, I was never the guy. It was, it was never the guy that could lay out a match, nor did I ever think I could. Um, but I knew where I wanted the story to go. We knew that we needed a big turn. We knew, you know, we wanted to do it on Savage. We knew, we knew, we knew. Um, and I left it up to the guys to lay out the match as best they could. So I guess my, my question is, when do you tell Hall and Nash? When do you tell the booking committee? Who did the booking committee think it would be? Did they still think it was Sting? When did you tell them it was Hogan? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I think by that time, probably a week before is when I started letting the people that need to know, know. I think I let Kevin know. I know I was out in L.A. doing something because Kevin and I had a – we met for a beer – over on Sunset Boulevard at a place that Peter Fonda used to own. It was a biker bar. And I think that's where I laid it out to him. Also, with the caveat that I wasn't sure if it was going to be either Hogan or Sting. One was a plan A, one was a plan B. I tried to keep it as, tried to get, tried to let him know as much as I, as I could without letting him know definitively. Partly because I didn't know for sure, partly because I didn't want him leaking it out. Um, so I, you know, I would say about a week before is when those who needed to know started to learn, not everybody, you know, there were people on the booking committee that I didn't want to tell. Um, you, you've, said, other you've said that a couple of times now that you felt like there were people on the booking committee that you couldn't really trust. What are we doing here? Let's name names, Kevin Sullivan, Greg Gagne. Who was it? You couldn't trust. Well, I couldn't trust Greg as much as I hate, you know, it pains me to say that. Um, just, I couldn't, you know, Mike Graham was a challenge time to time. Uh, never felt a hundred percent comfortable in, when, in terms of keeping confidence, uh, with Terry Taylor. Um, 
Kevin, Kevin, I kind of, for the most part, I, Kevin Sullivan, for the most part, at least for a good period of time, I trusted him um, to keep confidence. I didn't always trust his judgment, but I trusted him to keep my confidence when it was really important. Um, but, you know, there were a number of people that I didn't have 100% confidence in. It didn't mean that I knew for sure. It's just I was skeptical. Was, I mean, again, context is king. So much of everything leaked out that it had to be somebody in that booking committee. So it wasn't like I was paranoid and just, you know, creating shit in my own head. Um, it was a challenge keeping things a secret. Who in the company did you have confidence in? Is there anybody on the booking committee that you knew, Hey, he's rock solid with me. You know, when dusty was, was doing it, I trusted dusty. Um, beyond that, no one. You wrote in your book, as I was working through this dialogue with him, he being Hulk Hogan pronouns, pal, the name just popped into my head. I said, Hulk, when you grab that mic, I want you to say, this is the beginning of the new world order. The word sort of sprang into my mouth. New world order. Eric, is this your greatest freestyle ever? Um, I guess, (laughs) I mean, and here's the thing about working with Hulk, you know, he didn't, he hated scripts, you know, he didn't like memorizing stuff and it's, you know, it, Part of it is just the way he grew up in the business. Part of it was just the way he wanted to feel whatever he was going to talk about when he was in the ring. He, he just operated on a give me the bullet points, brother, and I'll get it done kind of a basis. Um, so there wasn't a lot of prep. You know, I didn't have, you know, even in my own mind going into it, I didn't have this firm idea of what I wanted him to say. I knew when he got to the building that he and I, like we had, you know, a hundred or 200 times prior, uh, we, he and I, you know, he and I would get together more often than not. I was holding the stick for him. It was either me or Gene and he trusted both of us and we would get together and we would, we'd walk through the bullet points and then half the time he'd hit him and half the time he'd improv. (laughs) So, um, he got to the building and we walked through it and, you know, it was a moment. I do recall it. We were in a, I, th- I think we were in a janitor's closet because I didn't want anybody else hearing what we were talking about. And the building was, you know, the building was crowded. There was people everywhere. And uh, we went through it a couple times. And I remember saying it going, wow, that's got a ring to it. <laughs> Kevin Sullivan has said that Hulk stayed at his house the night before. And he does this because you want to sort of keep an eye on him and keep his agent from turning him. Because allegedly Hogan's agent at the time, Peter Young was crying not to turn Hulk Hogan up until like two 30 in the morning. And allegedly everyone is telling Hogan, they're all in his ear. Don't do it. It won't work. You're going to ruin all that you've built. And so Kevin actually gets him to the building during the second match of the pay-per-view. This is all according to Kevin Sullivan. Is that the way you remember it that day? Well, I wasn't there. I mean, I mean, I wasn't at Kevin Sullivan's house, and I don't know if Peter Young was crying. I don't know if any of that is true. Um, Only the people that were there would be able to tell you that. I can tell you from my experience, it's plausible. I would say, I'd even go so far as to say it's probable, um, knowing the people involved. You know, Peter Young, I still talk to Peter Young all the time, and he's one of those, you know, the sky is falling kind of guys. You know, he's, he's like a... He's like a Jewish mother, you know, he's always, you know, wanting to protect and control and, you know, just be overly protective of of Hulk, always has, probably always will. So it's, it's probable. (laughs) I I don't think it's BS. What about showing up in the second match of the pay-per-view? Does that sound right? Yeah, because I didn't want him showing up early. I didn't want to take the, I didn't want him showing up until after the pay-per-view started um, so just no, because I didn't want it to leak. I yeah, just no, did, didn't want it to get out. No fans would see him if they're all in the building. No fans would see him if they're all in the building and everybody that was going to buy the pay-per-view had already purchased it. Now Hogan wrote in his book that you had to run the idea of him turning heel by Ted Turner. And Ted said something like, okay, give it a shot. Just leave yourself an out in case it blows up in your face. Is that accurate? Nope. So no conversation with Ted about turning Hulk bad guy. 
never. Let's get to the match itself. Hall and Nash are out without a third man. And of course they're taking on sting Lex Luger and Randy Savage. Luger does a stretcher job and Randy's taking a beating when Hogan comes out. When phone, when Hogan finally comes out in front of the crowd, is there any sense of relief in you that, Hey, he's finally going to do it. This is real. Not a sense of relief, a sense of excitement. I knew, I knew when I got done with him, you know, going through the promo, I could tell, you know, I knew him pretty well by that point. And I knew he was excited. You know, there's a difference between showing up and, you know, saying, okay, I guess we're going to do this and showing up and saying, oh, brother, I can't wait to get this done. I mean, he was excited about it and it was genuine and I could, you know, I could read it. So I wasn't relieved that he finally did it, but I was pretty damn excited to see what the reaction was going to be. I feel like we should take a time out here to remind everybody that, uh, while you are the former WCW president, I am in fact, just a fan. I'm the mortgage guy. And as much as I love talking old wrestling, man, my real passion is helping people become homeowners. And I'd love to help you. If you're a renter, let me ask you a question. After all those payments, what do you have to show for it? Isn't it time you got something for your family? Well, first family can make it happen right now. And you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. If you're a renter, I want you to take just a few minutes and check this site out for me. I think you'll be glad you did hide from rent.com. That's H I D E from rent.com. I'm telling you, this is easier than you ever thought possible. If you're still in an apartment, we can finally get your family into a house of your very own, your own backyard for your kids, a garage for your stuff, but maybe best of all, a kitchen big enough to host Thanksgiving, a chimney for Santa Claus. Whatever you're looking for, for your family, first family can make it happen. And you don't need perfect credit to do this. Even with scores in the 500s, we can make this happen. But maybe best of all, you don't need any money out of pocket. You see, if you found another apartment you like today, you'd have to pay your first month's rent, your last month's rent and a security deposit, but we can get you into a brand new home with no money down. It sounds too good to be true, but we can do it for you right now at hidefromrent.com. And I'm a list number six, five, zero, eight, four equal housing lender. Was there any doubt before he showed up in the building that day, at least in your mind that he might flip flop. I mean, did you not know he was locked in until you saw him that day? True. True. What, so look, I, mean, look, look, I mean, Terry Hulk has talked a lot about his personal life. And a lot of the stuff that he's had to go, he had to go through during that time. Um, his wife was tough on him and she had her own ideas about the wrestling business. Like everybody else who's ever watched it on television and never really done it. Um, she had very strong opinions about what was right and wrong and what was good for Hulk and good for the family and what wasn't. And I knew that, I mean, I'd been around him at that point quite a bit on both he and Linda. So I was a little bit concerned about that. I, it wouldn't have been unusual for Hulk to show up to the building and say, brother, you know, <laughs> it's just not going that well at home, brother. And, you know, for him to change his mind, whether he revealed that it was Linda in his ear or not. So, yeah, I was I was concerned about it. A sort of a silly question, I guess, but I feel like it's justified given what you just said. When the match started, did the other five guys in the match know? Yes. Um. I ask because Hogan, of course, has did the old, uh, or I guess rather Scott Hall has done the old, we didn't know until he showed up for sure. We knew he had been asked, but we weren't sure. Hypothetically, when Hogan agrees to do this and finally decides, okay, Eric, I'm going to turn heel. Does he have a contingency plan? Have you guys got a backup plan in place in case this does blow up in a bad way and not the way he wants? Could you, I'm sorry to do this to you, Connor, because you asked me that again, cause I'm not sure I understood it. Well, like, you know, what if the turn does isn't well received? So if, if Hogan turns and it's not getting over and it just falls flat and he feels like as Jim Cornette would say, he's deader than Kelsey's nuts. Is there a backup plan? Does Hogan say, what if it doesn't work brother? What are we going to do then? No. Okay. Meltzer said a few weeks before the show that Hulk was overheard telling Roddy Piper on a movie set that he asked to be the third man and was probably going to do it. So Meltzer actually wrote ahead of time that Roddy Piper had been told on a movie set that he might be the third guy. Did you ever read that? I never did. This is the first I've heard that. 
if Hulk doesn't end up showing up that day or he does show up and as they like to say, has the boo-boo face, how was Sting going to turn? I mean, you guys had a backup plan written, but obviously he's in the ring with them. At what point would Sting have turned? Do you recall? No, because I wouldn't have laid out the match. It would have we, we would have just gone into that match with a different uh, finish. We would have had to. Um, what? What? I, 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 I don't recall what you know. I wasn't a part of laying it. I wasn't a part of laying out Plan B, so I, w- I wouldn't have known what the finish was. Since it, since of the the guys in the ring. Savage was really more of the WWF guy. Was he ever considered for that role? And, and, and if not, why did Sting make more sense than Savage from a kayfabe storyline standpoint? Because, you know, a WCW guy, especially one of Sting's stature, if it would have had to been Sting, would have been a bigger turn than Randy Savage, quite frankly, um, in my opinion at that time. So it was more about getting the shock of a big baby face turning heel more so than we need someone from continuity standpoint, who's been up North to really play yeah. into the invasion storyline by a mile. Yes. By a mile. It's worth mentioning the pay-per-view here is sold out and you turn away more than 2000 fans uh, at the walk up that day. And the show actually starts with dusty mentioning that you're missing. You're not there. And allegedly you weren't there yet. Why did you guys mention that you were missing sort of insinuate that you'd been kidnapped, but then you dismiss it the next night on nitro. No, I was there. Um, I just wasn't obvious to everybody, but I was there. I got there early. Um, I'm not sure I really understand the question beyond, you know, why was I there or was I not well, there? Well, that's success on the pay-per-view and Bischoff's not here. Did they kidnap him? Well, that's storyline. It's creative. Right. I mean, it's, it's, you know, Adding suspense, I guess. I, I'm okay with that. I'm just saying the next night you dismissed it like it was silly bullshit. Sort of like the question, but we'll keep going. Meltzer wrote, and this is awesome. After a 15-year babyface run that started by accident, Hulk Hogan turned heel amidst incredible heat and in an angle that will be remembered for years. The heat with a literal flood of debris being thrown at the ring was as intense as anything seen in U.S. rings at a major arena since Jake Roberts and Love Machine were headlining in Los Angeles for AAA. After the match, Hogan gave one of his best interviews in years. He would continue. Hogan basically called the fans garbage and told them to stick it because of the way they had reacted to him the past few months after he had done all kinds of charity work. The half shoot half work interview was strong and focused enough that it incited enough heat that some fans in the building were ripping up and throwing down their Hogan merchandise and several people were even crying. How much of this promo did Hulk freestyle and how much was it, you know, sort of what you laid out? I laid out the tone and tenor. Um, the rest of it was him. That was him improv. What what do you think about the, uh, the fans reactions to this? I mean, they're throwing garbage in the ring. What are you thinking in the back as you're watching this go down? Could you have ever imagined they were going to fill the ring with garbage? I was thinking, oh my God, how am I going to hide this erection? <laughs> That's great. Um, as they're taking Savage out of the ring, a fan actually jumps in the ring and gets in Nash's face. And Nash takes him out. Hall comes over and kicks him very hard in the head a few times. And security drags him out of the ring in a weird way. And we always say That's bad. And fans shouldn't do that. But in a weird way, that sort of adds to it here. Does it not? So much. I mean, I had never seen anything like that before. I had never seen rings filled with garbage. I came into WCW at a time when they were giving tickets away to local winos who would fall asleep with a bag of wine in their lap at center stage. There may be 60 or 70 of them. So for me to see that kind of emotion and reaction to a story was mind-blowing. And, you know, I got to be careful how I say this in today's environment. Now, fuck it. I was super excited to see that idiot jump in the ring and get his ass kicked. I was super <laughs> excited to, to see that garbage getting thrown in the ring. Because to me, it, it was very obvious that we struck a raw nerve or we created a raw nerve. How we opened up an entire chest cavity exposed a lot of nerves. And it was amazing. 
just absolutely amazing. As the show was going off the air, Tony had one of his most famous calls of his entire career. Hulk Hogan, you can go to hell straight to hell. Did you feed him that? Is he freestyling? What a great line that is to end the show. No, I didn't feed him anything here. I'm, I'm remember I'm the guy that wanted people to react naturally. Right. I, I look, I get a lot of heat with that. I don't know if you and Tony have ever talked about this before, but I experimented at different times with, okay, I'm going to give him a bunch of the information and see how that feels. Or I'm just going to, you know, keep him out of the booking meeting and let them figure it out. Once I get at the table, I mean, I prefer the latter, quite honestly. If I'm doing play-by-play, -play, I don't want to know finishes. I don't want to know the heat spots. I want to react to it. And by that point, especially with this angle, I didn't tell anybody shit. I wanted them to react the way they – first of all, they should know how to react. You don't have to lay out a storyline for someone to see it playing out in front of them for them to figure out how they should react to it. They're pros. And I knew Tony was. And so was Bobby. I wasn't worried about whether or not they'd get it right. I was more worried about if I told them more than I needed to, would they foreshadow it? What was the uh, reaction in the back? I mean, when Hogan comes back through the curtain, how's he feeling? What's the mood in the back when you guys realize what's just happened? Everybody was elated. You know, guys that had been in the business, you know, for a long time. And, you know, a lot of more like me, they'd been in the business for 10, 15, 20 years, and they'd never really experienced anything like that. Um, they'd read about it. They'd heard about it. But nobody's ever experienced it. So I, I, I don't think there was anybody who was not four feet off the ground backstage. Everybody was. What, do you know what Ted Turner thought of Hogan's turn? No, we never talked about it. You know, it, it, it's another, you know, I guess narrative or urban, urban legend, you know, other than a couple Christmas parties um, and the one meeting I had with Ted about launching Nitro, I had zero conversations with Ted Turner. Zero. Well, there you go. I'm glad we're setting the record straight. You know, one of the most common questions that we get here is about Bobby Heenan's commentary that night. Of course, as Hogan's coming to the ring, and I guess it's worth mentioning Bobby Heenan has been burying Hulk Hogan on commentary as a heel commentator for well over 10 years by this point. So when he sees him here coming to the ring, he says, whose side is he on? And years later, when these clips will be shown, that's often clipped out because some people viewed it as a spoiler and Bobby may be hurting the surprise. Did you notice it when it happened? When did you hear it? Did Bobby have any sort of repercussions for this? What was your feeling about the line? Um, I didn't notice it when it happened because I wasn't watching it on a monitor. I had actually snuck up um, way up high in the, into the cheap seats and was kind of watching it because I wanted, to, I wanted to feel the crowd react to it. I didn't want to watch it on a monitor. So I, I wasn't listening to the commentary um, when, it, when it actually went down. Um, when I heard, you know, what happened, uh, I was, I was a little, I was a little pissed, you know, cause I thought, here we go again. Why do announcers feel the need to foreshadow? But it was minor, you know, on a scale of one to 10, it was a two. It was like, oh man, why'd that have to happen? But I wasn't angry. You know, there were no repercussions. I was going to fire Bobby. I, you know. I certainly don't think to this day he did it intentionally. I think, as you pointed out, he was a heel announcer. He didn't really trust Hogan. It was a natural instinct. If I probably, this is where, you know, not smartening people up, you know, can backfire on you. Sometimes it doesn't go exactly the way you want it to because they're improv -ing. Um So, no, I, you know, I didn't hear it. I was a little pissed, but I got over it pretty quick, and I don't think it was intentional. Let's talk about, uh, Melter's report. He would write Hogan had agreed to do the heel turn about 11 days before the show, largely because there was no place left in WCW for him. Had he not chosen to do so Hogan's contract with WCW was scheduled to expire after two more pay-per-view shows, Hogwild and Sturgis and Halloween havoc in Las Vegas by virtue of a sponsorship deal with slim Jims, They had long promised a Hogan Savage main event. 
Since WCW largely focuses its company around Monday night television ratings and pay-per-view buy rates, Hogan's huge contract had become expendable. Since Hogan doesn't work arena dates, his staying or going isn't a factor on them. And Hogan's usual great knack of timing, he left WCW to do a movie with Roddy Piper and Gary Busey just before the NBA playoffs changed the Monday night Nitro time slot and wreaked havoc on the ratings, which appeared to be a great leverage move. But in the end, Hogan proved to be the ultimate Fox once again, and that this angle on the surface appears to be the hottest angle in the history of WCW and Hogan, who a few weeks ago looked like a real outsider maneuvered himself back into being the centerpiece. Your response. Perfect. 2020 conspiratorial hindsight by Dave Meltzer. It's bullshit. It's just such bullshit. Number here, here's on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the biggest bullshit in that whole story that you just laid out from Meltzer. We never promised Slim Jim. No one ever promised Slim Jim because I made the deal with Slim Jim. I personally made it by myself with no help from anybody other than Randy, of course. Um, That was never a part of the deal. Never. Never breathed a syllable of that to anybody. Um, Had nothing to do with anything. So if that's the link that tied that all together, or at least one of them, the premise of that story just crumbled, in my opinion. The rest of it isn't true. You know, Hulk... Whether he was showing up on TV or not, in fact, I didn't want him on television most of the time. Unless it was an angle leading up to, to, to a pay-per-view, he was a less is more kind of guy for me. The more you saw of him, the less significance he had. And by the way, that's a, that wasn't a knock on him then, but we hired him knowing he was going to be a special attraction. Much like The Undertaker, well, was a couple of years ago or John Cena is now, or Brock Lesnar is now. If you see them every week, guess what? They just don't matter. They're like everybody else. And that's why we hired Hulk. That's why we structured the deal the way we structured it. And we would have structured another one in a very similar fashion, whether he was a part of the NWO angle or not. So the whole premise of that story is false, and none of the details are true. Meltzer also wrote Hogan's name was still a factor in buy rates, largely believed to be coming from young children who wouldn't be as apt to beg parents to buy the shows to see a heel Hogan, whatever revenue WCW merchandise brings in was put at major risk as well as Hogan was the top seller. And clearly those numbers should drop substantially for older and longtime fans. Seeing the biggest name in American wrestling do his first turn on a national scale is going to spark interest in a big way, particularly short term. WCW officials knew that the Hogan turn had to be done right, or it wouldn't be worth the risks and it could only be done once. And the long-term plan had to be finalized. Was anyone against it when this idea has sort of floated around Has anybody on the inner circle of WCW, like, I don't know about this man. He's selling a lot of merch. This might be bad for business. I don't mean creatively. Well, I mean, that, just that, from a well, revenue standpoint. That whole narrative, as dramatic as it probably sounded when, or, or, or read when people read it, is again, once again, it's just not true. That we weren't selling a lot of merchandise. I mean, it was insignificant. It was never a fact. Um, and in whether we were or not, the decision to turn Hall Keel was mine, and mine alone originally. His, he obviously had to be willing to do it. But I didn't have to get it approved. I didn't really give a damn what anybody else thought, nor did I have to ask their permission or tolerate their insecurities. And and as such, it never came up in conversation. I don't know where people get this stuff. It's like like people are writing novels after the fact and trying to make something that really doesn't exist sound really interesting and dramatic. It's just not friggin' true. About 10 days prior to the heel turn allegedly is when you tell Hall and Nash not to worry about the third man. Is it fair to say that they had both been pitching ideas? And if so, who were those guys sort of suggesting? They weren't really pitching ideas. We really didn't have that kind of relationship at the time. And I didn't see them often and I didn't talk to them on a regular basis over the phone. So no, they were, they weren't pitching ideas. I think Kevin and I probably talked about sting. A little bit, uh, but no, they weren't pitching any ideas to me. 
Okay. Well, let's put a bow on this, but before we do, uh, we've got to talk about it since we're here. Let's talk about the NWO logo. Who deserves the credit for that? When was it made? What was the creative process like? Because you know, when Meltzer's sort of freestyling, well, now that Hogan's a heel, it's really going to hurt merchandise sales. Boy, was he wrong. It's the hottest selling fucking shirt ever. I mean, arguably top three at worst, but what was the process like for this logo and the design? Um, it occurred short, I think right after we did, right after Bash at the Beach, we must have gone either immediately or almost immediately to the Disney MGM Studios to produce the worldwide shows. And I remember we were, you know, we were on the sound stage. We were working out of there for probably a week or 10 days straight. And, you know, we, we'd seen the turn. We knew that we were onto something hot. At that time, I was working pretty closely with Craig Leathers, who was my director, but I also leaned on him a lot for creative ideas, uh, whether it was music, you know, graphics, clearly graphics, that that was really a part of it. And I think that's where it started. And we were on location down at Disney, and we knew, we knew that we needed some new graphics for the NWO, you know, for Nitro coming up. So they started working on ideas there. And I think Craig worked with a group of people at um, Disney and said, OK, here's here, here's what we've done. Showed them some tape of the pay-per-view. You know, here's the attitude. Here's the vibe. You know, we're going to call it New World Order. Come back with some ideas. So I remember, you know, I wasn't part of that because I was busy doing other things. And that really wasn't my role anyway. And I remember Craig coming to me with a sketch of the NWO logo. And I went, boom, that's it. Great job. And I think, you know, he put over that it was not necessarily his idea. It was a collaboration between him and the, you know, some graphics people at Disney. And that's really where that came from. Let's talk about the theme music briefly. Who, how, when, tell us about putting this together. Yeah, pretty close to the same process. You know, we had to use music that was in the Turner music library. Uh, so typically what guys would do, and again, Craig would have, you know, had a couple of the people that he, you know, had working underneath him and him himself, everybody would have gotten together and said, okay, here's the vibe. Here's what it feels like. Let's go through the Turner, you know, music library and see what, see what we've got that may fit. And that's literally where it came from. Hogan was left off nitro the following night. And that just left Hall and Nash to do a promo with me and Gene. Is the thinking to keep Hulk off the show again, just less is more. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, let's get to some questions. We asked you guys once this won the poll, because this did win the poll on 83 weeks on Twitter. If you'd like to participate and ask questions next week, check us out on Twitter. It's at 83 weeks. That's the number eight, the number three and weeks should be pretty easy. Uh, Eric, we're going to rapid fire some questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Uh, Jeremy wants to know how close did Shawn Michaels come to being the third man? (laughs) Never, never a conversation, never a thought, never would have entertained it in the first place. Never, never would have happened. Brian wants to know what was the worst thing Eric was ever hit with? He's asking in regards to trash, uh, tobacco spit. Oh, horrible, horrible. I went from the ring got my limo, went to the hotel and I took about a three hour shower. It's Uh, hard to drink beer in the shower too, just so you know. Well, there you go. I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Savo wants to know out of Hall, Nash and Hogan, who was the most difficult to work with? Well, I mean, that's a toss up on any, any given day. Um, probably consistently over the long term, Scott Hall for, because of his chemical issues. Armando wants to know when Nash called play an adjective, did anyone in the back care or notice or rib him about it? No. Raul wants to know what were the original plans for the NWO before they became as popular as they did? The idea being, was it always supposed to be numerous stars and make it WCW versus NWO or no? Yes, it was supposed to be WCW versus NWO. That was the premise of the angle. And especially as it grew and it became more successful, and then all of a sudden we had a, a Thursday Night Thunder you know, kind of dropped in our lap, then it really became uh, the mission. So it, it, was always, it started out that way, and it became increasingly more uh, important in that regard as time went on. 
Uh, JNN wants to know, was Mike Enos aware of Scott Hall's debut on Nitro or was it kept hidden from the entire roster? I don't believe we told him. You know, the referee was smart to it because the referee would have had to make sure everybody understood what was going on and communicate it to the talent. But we didn't smart a lot of people up. That's awesome. Um, Drew wants to know any other negotiations with anyone else outside of the company to be the third man whatsoever. Nope. Never. We've covered that. Never happened. Chris wants to know, was there ever any thought to saving this reveal for a bigger pay-per-view like Starcade? No, because at the time bash at the beach, you know, they were, they were all pretty close. I think, you know, historically in the, in the eyes of the fans, Starcade was like the, you know, that was the one that people really associated, you know, with, with WCW probably the most, but in reality, bash at the beach and really Halloween havoc, um, were from a financial point of view as strong or getting stronger than Starcade. So no, it was bash at the beach and the timing was right. There was no way to hold that off. Uh, till you know December big diesel with our next to last question wants to know was there ever any consideration had Hogan not turned that the outsiders would have then tried to take over WCW by taking out Hulkamania instead of Hulk Hogan joining them so I guess the question here is let's say Sting is the third man is it a natural situation at that point that Hogan has to take on these guys as almost his real life dungeon of doom God, you had to bring up Dungeon of Doom. But God, I thought I was going to get through an entire freaking podcast without having to hear Dungeon of Doom. (laughs) You know what, Conrad? You said you were going to make me cry in your post the other day on Twitter, and I just laughed because I just know there's no way you could put enough pressure on me to make me cry. Well, at least I thought I knew because there's a tear in my eye right now thinking of the Dungeon of Doom. Um no, we, look, I, I knew we had Sting if we needed him. I knew we had Hulk because we wanted him. and We hoped that it was going to work. But I'd be lying to you if I told you that I had a plan for what would happen a month or two months later if Hulk would have decided not to turn. We really didn't think that far ahead. That's the truth. Conrad from Huntsville wants to know, is this the most important turn maybe even moment in the history of professional wrestling. It's hard for me to say, you know, from my perspective, yes, as a fan and as an executive and as somebody who, by the way, you know, was at WrestleMania a couple of weeks ago in New Orleans and I was still seeing, you know, NWO shirts everywhere I went. Um, so I think, you know, objectively, I think it's fair to say it probably was, but one of the things I've learned Conrad from Huntsville is that what's most significant to people subjectively to them is the impact that it had on their lives at that time. And I'm sure there were a lot of wrestling stories that got people just as emotional that took place in the sixties and the seventies, you know, the eighties, I'm sure there was, but in terms of overall revenue and the impact that it had on the industry, some of which we're still seeing today, not only in the NWO shirts that people are still wearing, you know, wherever we go, you see them, I see them, everybody does. You can watch Monday Night Raw and still see them. You can go to WWE.com and buy one for crying out loud. But the fact that there's still, you know, factions that are trying to bring that element, you know, and, and replicate that, that success suggests to me that it may be, if not the most important turn in storyline, at least one of, you know, top two or three. I mean, to me, it's number one, you know, I mean, it, it, the business was never changed again. You know, after this stone cold really started to take off, they had to double down on that show. And, um, the whole business got more of an edge, you know, the NWO and the rock and stone cold and DX and we were off to the races and, uh, this is really what started it all. And it's certainly what started it all for our podcast this week. And I know you want to know what's coming up next week. Well, we had an idea when we put the poll up and we wanted to go ahead and give you what won the poll first. And now we're going to second place next week. So tune in on May 7th, set your clocks, folks, set your calendars. It's coming your way on May 7th. You're going to get the finger poke of doom. Oh my God. Oh, I knew you were going to do that to me. Yeah. This is something you're going to have trouble defending my friend. We're going to start with the night after Starcade 98, where the booker 
beat the world champion who was undefeated after Eric just said that's the reason Kevin had to stop wrestling. And then we're going to go through the nitro after the finger poke of doom. So we're going to cover very extensively just a handful of weeks. And we're going to do that next week on May 7th, the following week on May 14th. This is going to get everybody talking Bret Hart in WCW. And to say that Bret has not been polite to Eric over the years would be an understatement. Uh, I would expect several receipts on May 14th on May 21st. We've got bash at the beach, 2000, one of the most controversial shows of all time, bro. And on May 28th, we're going to have a poll winner. So stay tuned next week. We're bringing you finger poke of doom the following week, Bret Hart and WCW. And that's when we'll announce the poll on May 21st. It's bash at the beach, 2000. And then the show is back in your hands on May 28th. We really appreciate you tuning in this week. We'd love to see you pick up a shirt over at ericbischoff.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. That's over at 83weeks.com. Hit the subscribe button anywhere you enjoy your podcast and be sure to leave us a five-star review. He is E. Bischoff on Twitter. I am at Hey Hey, it's Conrad. And Eric, I got to thank you, man. I had a great time going long form on the genesis of the NWO this week. Oh, thank you, Conrad. It, it really, it, it was fun. You you do challenge me because you just do such a great job, job doing your research, but it's, it's a fun experience. And I do want to remind fans, we've also got a twitch.tv channel. And tomorrow night, Tuesday night, I'm going to do a, an autopsy because I know you and I killed it tonight. We killed this show. So we're going to do an autopsy tomorrow on twitch.tv forward slash 83 weeks where the fans can ask some questions. So jump on in. Let's have some fun with this. I can't put this over enough guys. You know, I I know that there's a ton of wrestling podcasts out there. We've got a commitment from Eric here to be interactive, not only with asking your questions at the end of each show, but we're also going to let you pick the topics. And oh, by the way, if you buy a shirt, Eric's going to call and thank you. But as if that's not enough, he's going to do interactive live video with you tomorrow night and take your questions in case you didn't get a chance to ask a question on air, you'll get a chance to ask him tomorrow. And if you go ahead and subscribe to that Twitch 